Hello and welcome to Harry Potter and the Rewind Reviews. This week, Nothing But Static takes on Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, the Mike Newell Harry Potter film, and I'm going to lay a lot of this at his door. What the fuck happened? <laughs> what is this? What, what, well, what is I mean, this you know, not, not to get into truth too early, but... Uh, <laughs> It's, yeah, I think what happens is he watched the first 40 minutes of Prisoner of Azkaban and instead of doing the logical thing of going, oh, we will continue that dark tone and and emulate that in my film because then that will create a coherent uh, tone and series moving forward. He went, oh, he's done that. All right, then uh, let's make it funny and stuff. Uh, yeah, that's. Uh, I don't know if that's in the truth, but that's certainly what movie flame reported as to be the case. Well, see, uh, here's the thing, right? And, and uh, not to, just to jump straight in. We are we're, we're a movie podcast. If you want to hear, we usually do like a, the context of our history with the franchise. Uh, if you want to get a sample of that, we, we opened the first of these with that. So if you haven't listened to that yet, you want to know where Chris and I stand as, as fans of Harry Potter, but also these movies, you can get that from there. So to jump sort of straight into this. But I think as a premise, that's fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying the last movie was really dark, Let's mix up the tone. You know, a good album is a mixture of those sort of like those, uh, you know, like those big, big ups, the big fast paced songs and coming down to a nice little crescendo, slow it down for a minute, then bring it up again. I'm okay with that. Dark movie just happened. Let's do a light one. That's fine. Because the, then you, in theory, you do a light movie, but you end it with tragedy and the resurrection of Voldemort, right? On paper, I actually don't think that's terrible as a direction. In execution, this is the most manic, stressful thing I've ever sat... Like, the tone of this movie mm. is ADHD. <laughs> but is it... But it and but I, it's I say a... that as someone who very likely suffers from ADHD, you know, lives with ADHD. It's it's absolutely insane, this movie. Go on, what are you saying? But, you know, but, but what's nuts about it is... It's one of those... It's like... Uh, so... Yeah, let's just jump straight in. And like Dan said, the context is in other places. And, and yeah, I two, two big things. One, this movie makes me realise how much I forgive Prisoner of Azkaban for just, as we discussed last week, being ill-toured and cinematically beautiful. Because mm. some of the criticisms I'd levered at this movie are absolutely also criticisms of Prisoner of Azkaban. And, but the problem is, it's such a mess, this movie. I would use the word mess, because how can you get some things right, like going, okay, look. So, I mean, and it, I think this movie gets a lot of credit for cutting out Spew. Spew is one of the most obvious things this movie could cut out. Like, uh, So I don't, I don't think it gets any points for that. Some things are going to have to be cut. It's a massive book. Cutting out Spew, cutting out the Dursleys... Obvious and, wins. And Winky. I, I, and Winky, yeah. Just just clear things Ludo that can go. And that's what I was going to say. Ludo Bagman is the real one where it's like, you got that right movie. I can see a world where they try to sort of do Ludo in the way that Fudge has a presence, but kind of you feel like press, Fudge has a presence because he does in later movies as well. Like, Ludo is the real one where it's like, that is a smart decision. But... Then there's there's cases where they've done the exact opposite of that, and I I think the main I've realised the main problem with these movies as a whole, and I think it starts in Azkaban and gets more so the case here. The big crime is Dan. Everyone's you know we've made a thing of us saying in the books, right? But I feel like we're not the most guilty of that. I feel like the filmmakers are the most guilty of going. In the books, because often it seems like the logic for things being in the movie is, well, it was in the books. Why is Krakow going to be talking to Snape and looking at his arm? Well, it's in the books. Yeah, but you're not then going to do anything with You're not going to loop back to that. You're not going to do anything with that. Why do the wands touch and people come out? Well, it's in the books. And uh, we've got Dumbledore naming the... Spe- he doesn't talk about what it means, what it meant for Harry, what what it yeah. means in general. It well, just is, It's a is... thing that happens and then... It happens because it's in the book. And and so in some cases, I actually, despite myself, because they could have done more with it, but I actually think the way they handled Rita Skeeter, which is have her in there, have her be Rita Skeeter doing her Rita Skeeter thing, have an article that causes issues, 
but then that's all we've got time for. So we're not going to go back to Rita for the sake of it. We're not going to do the full Animangus plot for the sake of it. But, you know, you've got your Rita and she's there and she Rita's actions impact the characters. Now, I've got wider issues with the fight being in the in the because that's another one where I think actually the opposite. Why do Ron and Harry fall out? Well, it's in the books. It happens, isn't it? Yeah, but if you're not going to tell a story with that, if you're not going to do anything with that, other than it being something that happens, what's the point? So, yeah, yeah sorry, what were you going to say? Well, I was just going to say, it's, it's, the, it's that issue of what we talked about last week of, like, here's the thing, don't worry about the context. Like, the, like we've, you know, we've, we've, we've got... Okay, the perfect example of, of that being a huge problem in this movie, where it actually isn't just, oh, it's there and it doesn't do anything. There's one example in this movie where it actually is detrimental to the movie, um, which is the um, second task. So, pushes glasses up nose, <laughs> in the books, <laughs> the sequence where Harry lets the mer people, like, uh, goes to save them and stays to, until all the people are saved, turns out to have been a big, massive, stupid waste of time. He gets up to the surface, and they're like, obviously no one was going to die, Harry. Dumbledore knows the mer people, it was just a game, it's just a sport, you're an idiot. And then the joke is, oh, well, you know, your idiocy turns out to be moral fibre, you know, fucking typical Harry, you know, blowing it with stupidity, but coming out on top anyway, right? Or, or you know, or Dumbledore Harry bias again, you know, <laughs> whatever. Like, there's a joke to be done there, right? But in the movie, right, if you've not read the book and you do not have that context, it is at 100% a, a possibility that you would watch the sequence as it plays out in the movie... And come to the conclusion that those people were in danger. And that the school was recklessly trusting the lives of those four children to the other four children rescuing them. Because what the movie presents is just that Fleur is thrilled that he saved her sister. Not the joke that comes after that where someone says, you know, she wasn't in danger, right? Not that. Not that at all. Just she was in danger. Because they've kept the bit in the book where Harry does that and chooses to be, you know, to, to, to put moral fibre ahead of his winning the competition. But they've not chosen to include the context of, well, that was very stupid, actually. So what you get is a movie where it is genuinely feasible that a person would watch it and come out going, well, Hogwarts was going to kill those children quite happily, quite contently, for no reason, just for their dumb competition. Blood sport at Hogwarts. good oh, You know, that's what it comes across as. And I totally understand someone coming back, because there is nothing in this movie to contradict that. And that's one of those points where, again, context matters. Matters. You either put it in and you put it in properly and give it the context, or you don't include it at all. I actually feel differently about Rita Skeeter. Cut her. She adds nothing. She adds nothing to this movie. She doesn't mm. even have. A, a, her article barely gives Harry a character moment or Hermione. It's just. But, it, but at least it's. They're at slightly least it's annoyed com- for about it, 10 seconds and then we move on and, because the movie is and chaotic my, and schizophrenic and all over the place. My literal note, because I made some notes after, because we had to watch it, because of timings, we had to watch it two days ago, so I made some notes after. And my literal note does say Rita Skeeter doesn't really do anything. But the more I thought about it, the more I was like, at least it's a complete thing. At least they do, like, a complete thing with her, as opposed to crack off. And and um, flip in another one. Here's one for you. Why... Why is fl- why is it a v- why are they velas? You've not you you're kind of you, they're doing this weird dance as they enter. The boys are all reacting. If you've read the book, you know what that means. But you haven't set them up at the Quidditch World Cup. You haven't you're not doing any, doing anything with that. So why include it for the sake of including it? See, like and, see, that, and one I, world... that one I'm okay with because I don't think it's that they're velas. I think it's that you know teenage boys seeing a bunch of sort of like. Re, you know, attractive French girls sort yeah. of strutting through the hall. The joke is, you know, teenage boys' jaws agape. You know, that, that, I think that works fine. I, I don't think you need to, uh, but, uh, you know, it's it's, just... it, 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 it's not like at any point, you know, they actually have magical Vila powers. And only, and I believe only Fleur is part Vila anyway, even in the book. So I don't think... Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. But I... It's just maddening to me how some stuff they can get so... Because, look, it's a muddled mess. And as a big fan of the book, I hate the Barty Crouch stuff and the way they've handled it. But I can't deny if the line was with Prisoner of Azkaban was 
could you still follow it? Actually, I can't deny that in this movie, as much as I don't like it, because I don't like how they the changes they've made, you can follow it, and some set, some decisions, some elements of it, such as... Sh- oh, the weird tongue thing I fucking hate. But, like, such as embedding the polyjuice potion, hinting at polyjuice potion all the way along, which isn't isn't in the book, is apart from Snape's cupboard and a mm-hmm. few things, but, you know, you don't have Moaning Myrtle say about it. Mm-hmm. Is is a good move that some decisions make sense at least. <laughs> well, I I actually think generally I think they actually handled the Barty Crouch thing in the best way mm. they could have. Uh, yeah, honestly, I, I know you said you didn't know, because I honestly think cutting the entire he was in Azkaban, faked mm. his own death, all of that stuff. Harry seeing his name on the map and not really understanding why, thinking he's his dad. All of that stuff. His dad slowly going mad over the ser- over the course of the of, of it because he's being controlled with Imperius. All of that. Just yes, please get rid of it. Non- it's all and- in a movie like this. Trying to explain any of that makes no sense. It is so much easier to simplify it and say, "Look, Barty Crouch, who works for the Ministry, his son was a Death Eater. He's back helping Voldemort, as some of them are." And he snuck into Hogwarts under the guise of Moody. Yeah, and uh, that's and that, that clever that decision. Makes way, that, that is a really clever way to streamline that story and uh, uncomplicate uh, it. And the clever decision of it not being, you know, who who cast the dark mark and all of that stuff. It not being because I think movie because movie flame. I know I keep referencing him. He's done video essays on each film, and they're they're worth a watch. Twenty minutes, nice little watch. He doesn't like that some of the mysteries have been taken out, but actually, I think it's quite clever. To not rather than who cast a dark mark being a mystery, the mi- the the twist, the reveal in the film is Mad Eye Moody is Barty Crouch, like that, and that twist and all of that stuff is handled great. The only thing, because like I say, whilst I my to clarify my whilst part of me doesn't like it, that's the part of me that wants to see a twenty hour TV show adaptation of this book that doesn't like it. As I said, as a Compared to some of the things like um, Krakow, if I'm saying his name right, the headmaster, Karkaroff, uh, Karkaroff, you know, unlike, unlike half, I'm never going to say it right, (laughs) unlike that, Krakow, that's fine. (laughs) Uh, unlike that, where it's like you put some things in but don't give the conclusion, I think the Barty Crouch thing, I bring that up as an example of something that I think, A, matches the Prisoner of Azkaban test of... My memory of it was it didn't really make sense. Actually, this makes even more sense. It's even easier to follow yes, than how agreed. they adapted the Mar- Marondas and stuff. Uh, the only thing I don't like about it is <laughs> is the notion that at the end, it's like, I think they probably maybe should have killed him or something because he just gets sent back back into Azkaban in this. So why isn't he in all the other movies? <laughs> like, if yeah, I because was everyone that's in these... Azkaban is broken out of Azkaban in the next yeah. movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I was if I was watching all, if I was watching just the movies, I would be going, "Where's that guy gone to?" Which again is my whole thing of it feels like they put stuff in there because it's in the book and they feel like they should, and it just doesn't matter if the movie right. itself doesn't have all the context. And that I think I've concluded already. <laughs> you know, maybe I'll go back on it, but I don't think I will. That is my biggest problem with these movies because actually don't do that i haven't made up my mind on this what they should have done i just know i don't like the half ass that they did but the quidditch world cup is a great example because on the one hand i think it's quite clever to start at the world cup and him move the dream to him having the dream at the world cup <laughs> are, you, but are you about to reference to, uh, oh guys i can't wait to see this great quidditch world cup smash cut yeah. wasn't the quidditch world the cup great <laughs> The build-up, it's not the most offensive thing in this movie. There are two that really bug me, one that's genuinely offensive. Let me get that in next, because <laughs> can I just say for the for that thing, fuck this movie. But while we're talking about the Quidditch World Cup, the, the build-up, just the build-up and the anticipation and the only justification you can give, the only justification you can give is, well, it sets up Crumb. And it doesn't really. And also, as a character thing, we're doing that thing where we just rant and then need to dissect. But as a character thing... Crumb is completely mischaracterized in this film, in my opinion, to how he is in the books. Anyway, maybe we'll come back to it. But the the build up to the World Cup and then the slam cut is ridiculous. And I'm watching it going either 
don't do the Quidditch World Cup <laughs> or do more of the World Cup because you know what you could have slam cut, Dan. You know what you could have slam cut, and this is a this I think is a movie flame point. So I'm going to give them credit for this. Um, you could have slammed cut the dragon task. You don't need to have the dragon nonsensically fucking chase uh, well, Harry through see, the. Sc- it looks the, cool. Here's here's but, the thing. I'm not sure about that because that's like one of the few action beats in the st- in the story. <laughs> I don't know what happens if you lose that. I I agree with you in terms of the story. It doesn't need to be there, but like as as a movie, like the thing they're cutting around in the Quidditch World Cup is the action, and that's what's frustrating. Like, but the, like missing Harry's task when we've already just missed the other three champions because that's the other thing. It's the other three champions that goes well. Hey, hey, movie, little little nudge for you. If you want to build up the anticipation and the the expectations of this scene, how about you just show us a shot of Harry in the tent, like for, for like extended because there is a little shot of him in the tent before he gets called, uh, where he can hear the other contestants going up against the dragon and bits of commentary or something, and. It's just you're not seeing it, but you're just your fear and your imagination is running wild, like Harry's would be. Then he goes out and faces his own dragon. That way, we can get a hint of how the other champions did, and also, you know, we build up Harry instead of what we get, which is just, it's just. Do don't worry, wanna... the other the other champions. Yeah, they did it. They did it first. Don't worry about it. <laughs> can I do my? And there are some positive things to say, by the way, as well for people that love this movie. We will we will talk about those as well. But before that, can I get my big? Can I get my big fuck you to the movie out? Yeah, please. Fuck you, movie. This movie has Ron fat shame and bully another student. Fuck you, movie. There's no you, there's no defense to that in my opinion. It doesn't happen in the book. In the book, he makes com- when trying to work out who to get a date with, he makes comments I think about a girl's nose being in the wrong position or something like that. He says yeah, her, some, her he nose says is some, cent- central enough he, or something like he, that. He yeah, says yeah. some teenage boy shit about a girl in the book, but in the book you have Hermione reacting to him and pointing out that it is wrong and shaming him for saying it and reacting to it. It is made very clear in the book that what Ron is saying is not is not, you know, is not it, fair. It's not a acceptable. Good thing. Yeah, yeah. In the film, Ron is with the some of the other Gryffindor boys, and he makes a joke about one of the other girls, one of the girls on the other sizes' blouse popping open, or something like that. And the implication, the way it plays out, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, Dan. The implication seems to be that he's making a comment about the about that fourteen year old girl's weight. Correct? Yeah, that's the implication, and the movie doesn't challenge yeah. him because. The, yeah. You know, he he goes unchallenged. He basically comes out of it like it, it, the movie doesn't say that's not acceptable at any point. Which is exactly, which is and that's the difference. and that's the that's the difference between the book and the movie. Because if you know, I I can understand someone saying to that me criticizing that scene. Well, there's a bit of that in the book, yeah. But in the book, it's mainly challenged by the Hermione character. In the film, it is just cruel out of nowhere and just fucked up, in my opinion. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, I so, wasn't happy. Fuck you, movie, for that. Yeah, I mean, there's so many things to say. For this movie is absolutely madness. Like, every few minutes I was, like, scratching my head at a choice um, that this movie makes. But uh, let me start with a few things, though, because I, I do want to get into, like, this movie isn't just a problem for its own sake. It's also a problem because what I'm slowly realizing is I think that plot-wise... Um, oh, I'd like to correct something I said last week, actually, because I, I, I misphrased it. I said that uh, the Goblet of Fire book is the only Harry Potter book I'm aware of that has plot holes. And what I think I really mean is rather than plot holes, just awful contrivances. Plot contrivances, Mm. things that don't work or make sense. Because this movie has inherited a lot of... I I, I would say, as much as I really enjoy the Goblet of Fire book, and I would rank it quite highly, I think, amongst them, because of all the character stuff it does. From a plot perspective, it is the weakest Harry Potter story by quite some way for a number of reasons which i'm going to get into now because the both both things suffer from these faults okay first of all the bad guy's plan is insane and stupid and broken um you want to kidnap harry um how about you don't put him through a death tournament first because if you lose him then guess what you've lost him you fucking idiots number two you've snuck a teacher into hogwarts and you want to steal harry i don't know harry you're in detention um Take that pencil and uh, write some lines. Oh, he's touched the pencil and he's now in the graveyard. 
the p- pencil was a port key. There are a million ways this is a more the, the, of, uh, this plan could be done more sensibly than it is done. Um, spending the entire year as uh, Moody with the risk of being caught under Dumbledore's nose, as if Dumbledore wouldn't, after a year, notice one of his friends is not who he says he is. Fuck off. Like, it's so unbelievable. It's so ridiculously yeah, far-fetched. The, it it stretches believability to the insane degree, and it just makes no sense as a plan. What's nuts about it is Moody has to genuinely, like, form a good relationship with Harry and mentor him. And I, because one thing, and not to kind of, this is a big kind of, I think, last episode of this thing. Um, I will say, <laughs> one positive that I didn't expect to come out of this experience, don't know about you, Dan, but it's it's got me a bit more back into Harry Potter. So I listened to Stephen Fry do the last few chapters of Prisoner of Azkaban because I wanted to, you know, check my my theory that it wasn't as detailed in the film. Um, and I just I kept listening. I just kept I just went to the end of that book and then I just started Goblet of Fire. And the other day we went away for the weekend. I took the physical copy of the book. I read it. I, I'm I'm just about to go into the second task. And uh, yeah, so one thing I will say for doing this, um, I think that's nice. I'm I'm pleased with that. Um, but one, like you say, kind of plot issue with it is Moody has to genuinely form a yep. good relationship with Harry and come across like he genuinely admires him. And the defense of that is, well, he's playing a character and he's playing a character well, but like, it's a bit like, it's a bit hard to, to buy that. Like it's a the, bit, the other, the other problem is with, with this as a story is that the next book acts like Harry. There's one throwaway line about how Harry didn't really know Moody because he'd never actually been taught by him. But actually, they act as if all the character development for Moody in this book slash movie counts. Even, that's even worse in the movie, I believe, because I don't think the movie acknowledges it. <laughs> and Harry even, my memory is, Harry even calls him Professor. <laughs> like, I'm like, fuck off, you can't. Yeah, what and, are you and, doing? and, and, and like... in, the, in the book, when Harry calls him Professor, Moody says, I think that's what the throwaway line is, didn't get around to much teaching, did I? You know, he does just the whole grumpy thing. But, you know, uh, yeah. Really bad, just mm, ick. Because and it's broken in the book, it's broken in the film. It's just it, this is this is the section where I can address things that are broken in both. So before we start picking more directly on the movie, the other thing is the tournament is dumb and insane. You've just had a big terrorist attack at your big wizard c- gathering at the Quidditch World Cup. Uh, maybe don't hold another one at a school. Also, death tournament for children. Hmm. Um, not sure that's a good idea. Uh, I know they do the age line thing, but this is an insane idea. I don't understand it. Literally, they spend the entire movie and book telling us how dangerous this tournament is and was, and yet they still let children participate. It's insane. It's it's, it's just stupid, and it's begging for trouble. Um, especially especially tasks one and two, because tasks three, to some degree, and I can't remember the danger levels of the book because I've not got there yet, but. To task three, some degree, people could jump in. But what is their plan for a pupil drowning or getting burnt alive by a dragon? <laughs> like, what's the... What's the... How do you suddenly... Like, I understand. You're never going to let Ron, Hermione, Cho and Fleur's sister drown. You can quickly evaporate them to the top or the mermaids can bring them up if it looks like they're going to. I understand that. But for the dragon fire... Like, well, that could, that could kill someone, couldn't it? <laughs> So, yeah, it's a, it's a stupid idea. And then at the end, you know, Cedric's dead. Oh, no, someone died at our death tournament. What a shock. Like, I, I, like I, I'm b- b- consistently beguiled. Also, because both the movie and the book actually do a really good job establishing something's not right, and the characters that we are to understand are smart and clever and know these things are sensing it too. So we have Dumbledore in the book. Uh, and Well, in the, in the book, it's Sirius that says it, but in the... F- film it's Dumbledore something's going on there's some sort of plot occurring things are going mad this just there's all sorts of weird stuff we should maybe not do the tournament now like after the big terrorist attack at the at the Quidditch World Cup which is larger by quite some way in scale in the film than in the than the book 
yeah, easy, easy, yeah easy. Oh, we'll just we'll just hold another event and we'll do this one at a school. Like maybe, maybe rethink that. Uh, <laughs> maybe things aren't quite so copacetic. Like maybe things aren't quite so calm and, and peaceful in your world right now. And maybe that isn't a great time to bring back the Triwizard Tournament. Um, then there's obviously the practicalities of the tournament. Uh, they've clearly only brought a handful of children from Bobaton and Domestrang. Um, are those kids doing lessons? Are they studying? Are they just a, do they just miss a year of school? Um, we know that the the, 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 the the tournament champions that are selected don't take part in exams, um, uh, you know, so they can focus on the tournament. Uh, what does Cedric do for career, like when he doesn't have owls or whatever? Well, I mean, he dies, mm-hmm. but like, what's, what's he supposed to do not having done that? He's supposed to put, oh, I didn't get any exam results, but right. I did do the Triwizard tournament. I did do a sporting event. Um, I, just it's- insane. I don't understand I, it. I assume I don't think it's clarified. I assume they get tore in the boat and the and the ship, uh, the ship and the. But what's ba- what's happening back at those schools? <laughs> they're just without their head headmaster and headmistress for a year and a dozen of each student. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, I'm not. Yeah. No. I, like, I, the, the, the flaws I, in both the book and the movie. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't really work. I'm. I, it's. It. It never sat can, right with me. <laughs> can we add? Can we? I don't know. I assume you're not done. But can I just chip in with? Um, I think I'm pretty the fact much done. That the, <laughs> the the fact that the second and third tasks aren't actually, actually visually appealing for those in the crowd to watch. Oh yeah. 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 That's the, a subsection of my. The tournament is dumb. Uh, criticism. In, yeah. In what, the, what, in, why is there the, a crowd for either of those tasks? Well, in the film, arguably, with Harry's go at least with the dragon, even the first task is like you can't they can't see anything underwater and they can't see anything in the maze. So what's the point of having a crowd there? Like imagine yeah, and, if you were just I think looking they try to cover it in the book with, with commentary, like Ludo Ludo Bagman provides commentary, but you've cut his character. Mm. Um yeah, mad. And also, just like Quidditch, the scoring system is broken in both the film and the book. Now, in different ways. In the book, it's just insane that at the end of the day, those first two tasks were just to get a 10-second advantage in the maze. <laughs> yeah. I would literally just You're get right. to the dragon and be like, nah, I'll come last, thanks. I'll take my chances in the maze. <laughs> I'll, I'll go in last. <laughs> Cool. Take care, guys. Bye. Uh, <laughs> and then I get to the the, the the river and be like, "Anyone actually gonna die? No. This is just a, a game. Okay. Um, I'll let you rescue uh, and pull up my. I'm just gonna wait and I'll I'll, I'll I'll go for the cup in the maze. Like it, it like Quidditch. It's a weird weird thing where like all of the build up is just like absolutely pointless. You just, you just want to do well at the last bit, catching the snitch, g- grabbing the cup. That's where it matters. Well, I mean, you 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 say that, but you know, crumb. Crumb caught the snitch and the snitch in Still Island one, so in the book at least in the film, fuck knows what happens. We don't get to yeah. see it. Well, but- yeah, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and they they try to pass it. It's because it's because they wanted. It's so funny because you could so tell in the book what J.K. was going for. She wanted Ireland to win because she wanted, you know, she wanted the, the the our characters to have jubilation before the disaster that follows. But she also wanted to establish Crumb's skill. <laughs> so she had to find this weird thing. Yeah. Like, where he knew they were going to lose and was just ending it sooner, which is just an insane explanation for it. Anyway, doesn't matter. My point it's, is, especially, all these especially things are the notion. Both. The notion of a sports person doing that. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> because actually, what he could have done is. Because I, I did think a better explanation for that would be. And I, maybe this does happen, but then, but then they do that. They have the characters talk about it, and Harry says Crumb knew they were going to win. He wanted to lose on his own terms. Why didn't they just have the other, the other seeker, like really going for it? Because then it's like, well, he had no choice but to grab the snitch, because otherwise the other, the other team would have grabbed the snitch, and he wouldn't have wanted that. He, you know, he wouldn't wanted to lose by that big a margin, so he caught it to avoid them completely trouncing them is a much better explanation for why he does that than the one that's offered. That is a book thing, but yeah, yeah. carry on. Yeah, so um, yeah, those are things that are broken in the book. Uh, so I'm forced to con- contend with the notion that this might be structurally and like logically speaking probably the weakest book. I do think, again, I still really enjoy that book. It's still high on my ranking because I really think they do some really good character stuff. The Ron and Harry uh, d- d- friendship sort of imploding in the, in the early parts of the book is really good. Um, Harry's 
circumstance of being thrown into the tournament is all handled really well. The way they describe how he feels about it, mixed feelings, because he's a slightly arrogant boy and did vaguely dream of being, you know, of, 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 of glory and, and all that stuff. But he never really actually considered it. Um, so it's like the fear of being thrust into it. There's just a lot of really good stuff in the book that uh, about the character stuff, but that's, you know, but the actual logical anything of it. Like, again, I, will, I cannot stress enough how bad Barty Crouch's plan is. Barty Crouch Jr.'s plan, sorry, is. Yeah, oh, it's madness because Moody Moody has multiple opportunities. Even if only in special circumstances, maybe you get a port key. Moody could form a relationship and he could say he could get Harry down to Hogsmeade. He could attack him at Hogsmeade. Like there's so many ways to do it. J- 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 um, what do you think? Yeah. JK was determined to introduce some sort of new method of fast travel every single book. <laughs> yeah, because it's um it's well there's two in this, isn't there? There's port keys and evaporation. Oh, dis- oh, yeah, disapparation. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's, and then, of course, yeah, we've got flu powder, and then we have them traveling by um, Festral in another movie. Like, that's my question as well. Is like, yeah. it, when you go back to Philosopher's Stone, and you like, the, 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 the Quirrell's great plan was to t- trick Dumbledore into going to the ministry, saying that they needed him there, summoning him into the ministry, but actually, he, didn't, he wasn't needed there. It was all just a, it was a trick. In a world where flu powder and uh, an and apparition and... Uh, mm-hmm. uh, port keys exist. I, that that plan doesn't work because <laughs> he's there in a second. No. He's back in a second. Think, because you've invented twenty. It. You've invented twenty forms of, of fast but travel. Those those new ways to those new ways to get around, build and build it <laughs> until eventually they're just riding a dragon in the seventh book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um. Let's talk. Let's talk, Harry and Ron, because. Yes, please. I don't know how I get, I, I look, I, as much as I'm sitting here grouchy and going, they're clearly going, why does it happen well in the book? Da, 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 da. I do also understand that. I understand that if this movie had come out and it didn't feature the Quidditch World Cup, people would have criticised it and it would have been weird if Harry and Ron didn't fall out. But my God, is it not set up? For Set up is, the, is one huge problem. Like there's one moment, as far as I could tell, where Harry Harry's got more money to buy sweets, which isn't really even what it's about. But there's one moment prior to the fallout in the film where you go, that could point to trouble. But it's not built up to... It's not... They just do nothing with it. Time is wasted on the awful, like... Oh, Hagrid... Seema said to Hagrid, da 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 yeah. Oh, no, well, that was actually me, you see. All of that stuff is just crap and doesn't add but anything. What, but what's I, frustrating about that stuff is not only is it crap and not add anything, but it's... So it's it's kind of like weird... It makes their whole fallout some sort of weird, contrived sitcom nonsense, sort of a misunderstanding, you know... Ron was trying to tell Har- warn Harry about the dragon, but then Harry doesn't realise that, so when Harry finds out Ron knew, he's annoyed at him for not telling him. Why would you contrive a worse reason for them to fall out, or to be part of the fallout, than just exploring the one that's there on the page? Yeah. Because the, yeah. use that time to actually explore the problem, which is Ron's complex that he develops being the friend of famous, successful sports champion... Harry Potter like that's a lot to live up to in a world where you also have to live up to all your brothers who have gone on to do important things it's a really rich and very logical character piece in the books and when it's sitting there and Clove sat down and went nah not going to explore any of that boring let's have a misunderstanding be at the crux of this what are you fucking insane? That doesn't save time. It doesn't do anything. Use that time to tell the actual story, you piece of shit. And, hey, if you go, well, actually, it's kind of pointless because the way the movie's structured, you know, in the book, like that small section of the story between Harry getting the, um, uh, Harry uh, getting chosen and the dragon is pretty quick. So, you know, we can't go into too much detail because it's only really a small part of our story. Well, how about you make it last longer then? Maybe Ron and Harry have fallen out till the second task. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, completely. I'm okay and with you, that. And and there's loads of little nuances. You rather than this weird contrived Harry hinted at the dragons through the 
backwards way because Charlie, who we don't see, told him. Just ridiculous. Why is that there? Because it's in the book that it's Charlie, so it has to be. Like, if you want to, if you want to have some Ron does still care nuances, keep the the little ones that are in the book that you could keep. Like, for example, it's Ron that interrupts Sirius talking in the book. But when Harry asks what he's doing, Ron says, I just wondered where you... Never mind. Like, Ron's worried about where Harry is, so he goes looking for him, even though they've fallen out. You could put that in, no problem in this film. And I tell you what, that one 30-second sentence will be a much better moment than that weird bollocks about how Ron is the reason Hagrid showed him the dragons. Sorry, I lost you a little bit there. What was that last sentence? That that one heart, that one sentence, that one thirty second sentence indicating that Ron still cares will be a better moment than the, the weird half assed way yes, round that agreed. Ron helped him. A hundred percent, and that's it's so frustrating because it's like you've put it in, do it properly then, like or take it out. Like it's the it's the you know it's it's also the egg thing, right? The, cut the egg out. I don't. I don't understand the logic here. You've got a whole sequence of events that has Harry trying to crack the clue and going to the bath and Myrtle being a creepy creeperson again, and like all of that could be time saved by simply having Cedric approach Harry and being like, "Look, I found out what the next task is. You're gonna have to breathe underwater and get something for an hour." And Harry's like, "How did you find out?" He's like, "Don't worry about it." You've, you, I'm repaying the dragon thing. I'm repaying the favor. And then Cedric leaves. Harry then knows what he has to do. We have the whole he looks for Gillyweed thing. We've saved about 10, 15 minutes and the creepy Myrtle scene. And what we've gained, other than the time back, is we've cont- we've actually also made Moody's plan better because he's just directly told Cedric what the next task is. Because that's how Cedric's fine. Yeah. It, it hints Whilst- at the Moody plot and it and it streamlines the movie by about 10 minutes and it cuts a horrible scene the bath thing which i st- which i hate <laughs> and is awful yeah it's such a weird scene whilst um even weirder knowing whilst... how old that actress is yeah and how old harry's meant to be like which is why you know yeah. like like i said my anger with the whole ron bullying that girl thing is like she's 14 um the as in the the characters I believe would be fourteen yeah because Hogwarts year mm-hmm. one is eleven so twelve thirteen fourteen yeah um yeah I agree that would be much make much more sense although I do have to say if they're gonna do it the condensing of the gillyweed of it all and actually it being Neville when we see Moody give him the book and we avoid the Dobby of it all mm-hmm. and it That's being fine. that Neville. All of that was actually, that that element is another example of them actually adapting. That's what's so frustrating. There are hints that they can adapt some of this stuff well, because that is a much, for the movie, that is a much cleaner way of doing that than the book's version, which is to do that, but it doesn't work, so Dobby gives it to him. Um, yeah, much, much cleaner. And yeah. you get some pumpkin you get some pumpkin juice hints as well. Although, at what point in the second movie does Snape know that they're brewing polyjuice, polyjuice potion? <laughs> in order for Snape to reference it in this. Well, see, now that's interesting, isn't it? So I think in that that's also in the book where he says some of those ingredients also went missing a couple of years ago and he thought it was Harry that. I think they, they I think that's but one of those, it's a problem in the book and the movie inherits it sort of issues. But um, Okay, fair enough. But yeah, I, I, so I, I don't mind that so much. Um, I think that's fine because I think the movie really leans into the polyjuice mystery Um and I guess that's fine. I don't really necessarily have a problem. Yeah, I think with no, that. I thought that was quite clever. I, I think I think someone could easily guess the twist. Um, but I mm. think that's good. I think it's good that they're embedding it. Very rare these films do so little embedding of things. It is literally this is the scene. What does this scene need to achieve? Okay, we'll have this scene achieve this this thing. <laughs> And blow blow whether it makes any sense or whether it adds anything to the characters. That actually the fact that this film has some shit embedded, as we said, all of the Barty stuff, I think, is actually done quite well. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah and I that's think the polyjuice of it weird, all is part tiny, of it. It's what, as well, is it what really adds up are just like weird small choices as well, like introducing Cedric by having him just sort of fall out of a tree. Like, like it's such a small choice, but such a weird choice. Like, oh yeah, you know. We're trying to introduce this guy as like, you know, the new hotness, the new thing. He's going to come down. He's going to be all charming and good looking and all the girls are going to swoon. How do we introduce him? I don't know. He falls out of a tree, like some sort of 
eleven year old oh, scamp. Mate, the, the <laughs> what? Ced, the, the, the Cedric, he barely fucking says anything. Yeah. I think that scene. I think that scene where he gives him the hint, and at least they chuck in a little. Oh, I've told them not to wear the badges to humanize him in some way. But there's honestly, I think there's more work done to humanize the dad than Cedric. And what's annoying about that is. It's actually quite effective because it makes the death the only reason the death hits at all is because of his dad's reaction to it and the focus on him. Like yeah, who's Cedric that, who's is that actor, Cedric... by the way. He's great. Like I'm going to look that up. I don't know who that guy I don't is, know, but, he's, but he's brilliant. He's in brilliant. This movie. Yeah, and it really. I mean, it, thank God for him and that the, the writing of his part because in his performance of his part. Because, you know, it really comes together because of it. Because I'm sorry, and I don't particularly blame... I know people have levelled plenty of criticism in the past at Robert Patterson's acting. But he's literally not given anything to work with here. Like, <laughs> this... The, the, that, I do not put the blame solely at Robert Patterson's door for the fact that Cedric doesn't fucking say any dialogue until near enough the second task. <laughs> Yeah, his uh, his name is Jeff Roll, and um, Mr. Roll, if you're listening, good work, really good work. You're excellent in this. Yeah, movie. he he that that's actually I was quite taken aback by how powerful I found. I I have no memory of finding that powerful in the past. Um, but I mean, I might have found it powerful, but just forgot about it because I didn't have to analyze it for a podcast. But the I really found that impactful and well done when he returns with the body. Um, yeah, and I and think like yeah. you know, okay, you, you're not going to take the time to like. This is the other thing. Okay, there's too ah too. Many. This is why Rita Skeeter is a pointless inclusion. There are already you're introducing too many characters to have time to do any of them. Um, I, I you know I don't want to I don't want to harp on this too much, but Victor Crumb has two lines in the movie. He says he says twenty words in the entire movie. Twenty words. So anyone who's how wrong they got that character, give it. Go on, sorry. It's it's amazing how wrong they got that character given that he only has 22 words. Well, the, the thing is, though, I will say with characterization, I'm not sure there is a wrong or a right in that if you want to do a different thing with the character that the book did, if you have a different interpretation of the character, I don't think that's necessarily a problem. But you've got to give him enough lines to express it then. So if they've made a deliberate decision, this crumb's different to the book crumb because we have a different thing we want to achieve with him, right? Okay, I respect that as a creative. You want to make a different choice? Make that choice then and actually do something with that choice. Um, the problem isn't the change. The problem is the lack of anything being done with the change. You're right. He is differently characterized to the, to, to the book. Yeah, for, for context. So the question becomes, I, I, and why? <laughs> right? That's yeah, the real issue. It's, it's not that they've chosen yeah, to do right. that. It's that they've done nothing with it. Like, I do, he's, do it for a he's reason. He's basically a bit... He's a bit bullshier, basically. He's a bit more sullen. A bit. He's not all about the glory in the book. Whereas in this, he's he's geeing up the crowd at the Quidditch World Cup. He's always he's always putting his fist in the air. That was kind of seemingly the only direction for that actor. Every time the camera's on you, just put your fist in the air and be like, Way! like it's just yeah, it's it's different to how and, how and hold it, hold, hold this stick, just a stick. Yeah, we'll add motion blur later. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's gonna, it's gonna be some uh, real good motion blur on that stick. Okay, um, yeah. So I think you know. Again, I'm not against inherently the cho- the cho- the choice to make to make it the character different, bolder, brasher. I like that in the movies. This ha- version of Harry is slightly subtler than the, you know the, the, the and less uh, arrogant than the book counterpart. I think that's an interesting choice. I I I'm not against the. I'm not against them making this Harry less arrogant because in the uh, in the book in the version of this he does dream of you know his moment of glory, and it's almost kind of like because oh yeah because we have, oh my god when I talked about the tournament is done we didn't even talk about the big the big flaw that's in both the book and the film which is Harry doesn't need to take part like the, 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 <laughs> just show up wave at everyone I've turned up. As is contractually obligated, because my name came out of the goblet, and I, uh, I quit. Walk into the maze, shoot red sparks up. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Th- this whole idea that he has to take part in the tournament is vague and weird. And they talk about magically binding, but they never define it in both the film and the book. Fuck that. That makes no sense. <laughs> but the red, the the red sparks is another one. Sorry, like. They, 
We know what that means because we've read the book and we know that if anyone gets in trouble, they can raise red sparks. And I know you could work that out, but it's still weird when there's no context to it. Huh? Yeah, it's not said. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just odd because I I would watch it and go, well, what's going on there then? (laughs) Yeah. So for those who don't know in the book, before they go into the maze, they're told if you get into any trouble and you wish to be rescued, the maze is so large, we're not going to necessarily know you're in trouble. So shoot up the red sparks we'll see those from a distance we can come in and we can help you we've got teachers you know teachers and other you know uh, ministry people uh, around the perimeter of the maze they'll come in and help so harry sends up the red sparks for fleur so she gets assistance and isn't just left in the maze and then he carries on in the film he finds fleur shoots red sparks up and fucks off which i could be interpreted as hey harry maybe use some of that magic to help her like (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, she's clearly injured. <laughs> Do something. But I don't the think they Red even... Sparks just feels <laughs> like you're just... I'm just being really... Com- I'm, uh, uh, victory! <laughs> Red Sparks, another they... one down. <laughs> Do they even... Do they even... In, in uh, Mad Eye slash Crouch's kind of exposition speech of I gave Neville this, I did this, this... No, they never explain. That, that, that isn't a criticism, but... Yeah, I don't think they actually clarify that he put the curse on Crumb, does he? Nope. Nope, no point. <laughs> but here's my other thing now, and this is a film problem, not a book problem. Uh, I got a question for you, Chris. Right? Imagine you've just read the book. Uh, sorry, you've not read the book. You've just seen this movie, right? You don't have no other information. What's the threat in the maze? As a, as a competition, as a, you know, as the champions going in to get the. The, the the cup based on the movie what's the threat of the maze the hedges the hedges the hedges dragging them underground or into the hedges okay. is the threat in the movie it's ridiculous because other if there wasn't a crumb if crumb wasn't running around attacking them i don't know what this competition is there's nothing in there. There's no monsters. There's no uh, riddles lurking in the dark. There's and no nothing. There's, it's, it's just get to the center and, and you know, and don't when, get tripped up by the moving hedges. When And obviously there's Knowles as well, but when there's literal clips of Mike Newell, who directed this movie, didn't direct any of the others, but when there's literal clips of Mike Newell talking about how he wanted the maze to represent turning them into animals... It's hard not to bl- lay the blame for that at his door. Because yes. you're right, it's absolutely a problem. The only real threat in the maze is Crumb, and then the fact that the hedges can seemingly knock them unconscious and drag them in and capture them. But that's not that's not a thing. We've built up to we've built up to bad shrubbery. Like what's and and Crumb and Crumb's now a bad guy because in the film there is no context as to I mean I suppose his eyes gloss yes. over the way we've seen that curse used in in other parts of the movie, um, but it's just not really explained and I just again like and I don't want to I, I, I will make an effort not to repeat this point but it really I really felt watching this movie ah I can really pinpoint it now. It's the amount of stuff that feels like it's there just because it should be there than is actually explained. Now, I I don't know how you do a version of this story and cut things like... Uh, well, I it, look, it takes a very, very brave filmmaker and filmmaking team to do this movie and go, let's not bother with the Quidditch World Cup or let's not bother with the ones hitting and the ghost coming out because we're not going to do anything with it. But if you just they don't I, do see, anything I don't with those, those I don't think those are the problem. I think you can have the Quidditch Cup. The, the Quidditch scene in the previous movie was three to four minutes long. Mm. You know, the one where um, that Harry's been... Was it, wait, he which sees one's the, the dog in the sky. Yeah, yeah. He sees yeah, yeah. the dog in the sky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge dog in the sky. And then the one before where he's chased by the bludger. Three to four minutes, right? The thing is, you need to save time other ways, I think, to make room for those and do those ones right, because those ones are important. That's the other thing. It's about selecting what is and what is not important. Priori incantatum is important. If you'd like to characterise Crumb correctly, or at all, the Quidditch World Cup is important, right? So, and you also introduce a ton of characters that way as well, because that's how we meet Barty, it's how we meet, you know, it's how we meet several characters that become relevant to the remainder of this movie. You cut Rita Skeeter, you cut the egg nonsense, you cut 
you know, a ton, like uh, the, all the small things, like the, the whole Ron Harry mix up over the who sent him for the dragons. If you're not going to do that relationship, that that falling out because you've decided it doesn't really fit properly into the to, to the to the great, you know, then don't do it. Just take that out altogether. I think priori and cantatum is really important, and I think that should be kept. I think it should be kept because you, it, it's it's well, it's just a, it's a huge part of the law going forward. But also, it's like a, it's one of the most iconic visuals from the book as well. Having all of Voldemort's ghosts. You know the ghosts of those he's m- most recently murdered surround him to distract him for a second to give Harry that moment to escape. Because the other important thing about that is, you don't have that question of how did a teenage boy escape Voldemort yet again? Well, this time he had help. <laughs> you know he always has help. That's the whole point of Harry: is it's love and it's his relationships with the- those around him that keep him alive when otherwise he would be dead. You know, he, without his mother's sacrifice, he would have died as a baby. Without the, the, those ghosts, those sort of those memories, whatever you want to call them, those those visions of the people, uh, you know, that, that Voldemort has slain, taking action in that moment, Harry would have died to that too. So, I think Priory and Cantatum is really important. I don't think you, I don't think there's a version of the script where you cut that. But let me tell you, you can definitely cut Rita Skeeter. <laughs> she does not need to be in this movie. You know, they found it in their hearts to cut Dobby and Winky. Uh, and that whole subplot. They found it in their hearts to cut the whole Barty Crouch Jr. escaping from Azkaban by pretending, by swapping with his dying mother and faking his own death and all that nonsense. You, f- f- you know, there's no Patilda bag shot. Great. You've, you know, you've you've chosen to cut so much stuff. Then you need to just go that little bit further to make room for the other stuff I and just, make the stuff you are keeping explored properly. They they got the ratio what, wrong. Not- it's it's not cutting that, and I can't name the spell. But it's not it's not cutting the spell then when the ones meet. But just add a just add a line where Dumbledore goes. This means your ones probably can't fight each other because that's going to be relevant later. Don't have him just name the fucking spell, like, and maybe make an attempt at touching on the fact that Harry's just seen his dead parents, like, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Do something with it. Do, do it properly. Do it's a meaningful moment. It. It's the same problem. It's here's the moment without the context, without the actual benefit, without doing the thing the moment is there to do because we've stripped it back to its barest bones. And that's because the movie is overstuffed with a bunch of other shit that doesn't need to be there. Uh, you know, and, 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 and the funny thing is, a lot of it was accidents, you know. The, the, the actors that play the Dursleys were too expensive. They they asked for more money for this one because their, their original contracts were expiring. Um, so that's the reason the Dursleys aren't in this movie, not because they made a smart choice. Mm. And I think that's a, that's a really good choice, you know. But here we go, you know, we're, we're in a world where that would have been in the fucking movie otherwise. <laughs> and we don't need it. <laughs> um, you know... T- Cut down Madame Maxine to a nothing role, then, if you, if you, you know, or, or, you know, because giving her a tiny bit of Madame Maxine, but not enough, not, because that's the other thing, here's a character without their, uh, uh, you know, their relevant plot, Madame Maxine in the movie, they even have a hint of the scene where Hagrid and her discuss the giant, the giant blood, but they don't actually then play that out into a character beat for either character, so why is it here? Take it out, it doesn't need to be there. Madame Maxine can just be the funny, quirky headmaster of the other school. That's it. That's all she needs to be. completely. Why are we spending time showing a scene where her and Hagrid are having that conversation? Yeah. No, completely agree. There's so many little things you could cut. So many little things you could cut that you could then use to make the rest of the movie good. Uh, But, with that said, Chris, let's talk about some things that do work about the movie because we've done a lot of ragging on the movie. And I do have some things I like about this movie. I love, 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 love everything in this movie relating to teenage angst, awkwardness, going to dances that whole section of the movie is fucking chef's kiss i love it it's so good it's 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 awkward and weird and frustrating and all the things it needs to be um the school dance starting as like a formal ball but then degrading into what looks like a a whole concert but then it pulls back and there's like 20 kids at the front of the stage and that's it (laughs) you know what i what i love about that is i really and i'm pretty sure there's no more Britpop icons. But between Ian Brown randomly stirring a cup in Azkaban and Jarvis Cocker yep. performing at the Yule Ball and Goblet of Fire, I'm like, 
have I forgotten that Noel Gallagher is on a Thestral at one point in, in Order of the Phoenix? Like, did they just insert a 90s Britpop icon into every film? <laughs> There's that two, isn't there? There's, there's two of this. Isn't that band comprised of two different? Um... Let me uh, see. Might be. I only really noticed. Um... Is it maybe someone from Radi- Radiohead? Yeah, I there's someone from, there's someone from Radiohead and someone from Blur. I think. I think. Oh, that's... really? What the band is just completely made up of? Yeah, I think so. Let me. Mm. Let me. I'm gonna. I'll look it up. I'll look it up. I, 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 you know. I'll. I'll, I'll, yes, I'll Google I, it. I agree. Uh, I've got it here. Oh, you're going to look it up anyway. Right, that's fine. Um, yes, I agree with you about all of the Yule Ball um, stuff. I think the... You know what? Not ideal because I like the awkwardness of it in the book. Um, and also, <laughs> without being, this is a real in the book moment. But in the book, the joke is that Harry says, you want to go with the ball with me? So quick that it's inaudible. In the film, <laughs> I'm sorry, you can make out what he said, Joe. You don't need him to repeat that. Like, in the book, it's like, do you want to go to the ball with me? But in the film, it's, do you want to go to the ball with me? Like, I'm sorry, you can make you can make out what he said there, Joe. You don't need... Like, that's not... You're doing the same joke, but the delivery is off to make the joke work. Um, but having said that, Ron and Hermione, their fallout, Ron's reaction... When he's going, well, that's, uh, that's com- completely missing the point of uh, of what I was saying. Emma Watson's reaction when she yells at him, "Why don't you ask me yourself and not as a last resort?" So good. And then sits down on the steps. The way, the way, the way Hermione, the way Hermione sends Harry to bed, like yeah, honestly, wonderfully done. Uh, and and Daniel Radcliffe is just like, uh, I'm not really. I'm not really involved in this, but okay. <laughs> yeah, cut, cut, cutting to them later where everyone else is having fun, and just at the back of the room is just Ron uh, and the Ron, Harry, and the Patil twins just sat looking miserable. Are you ever going to ask me to dance? That's amazing. Uh, Fred, Fred asking out Angelina Johnson is just glorious. <laughs> They've changed yeah, it yeah. for the film. So in the, I, I think both work amazingly. So I, this is not a. Oh, I preferred the book version. But just for context, for people who don't know, the book version is just wrong. Goes, well, you haven't asked anyone out there yet. And Fred goes, oh, yeah, you're right. Angelina. Yeah. You want to go to the ball with me? Uh, yeah. Cool. <laughs> and it's just, that's it. Yeah. I think it's very funny and it says a lot about his character and all that. But in the movie, they take it an extra yeah. step. They make it extra baller that he does it completely silently. So he throws a ball of paper at her during a lesson. She looks around and then he's sort of like points like you know you, you me and then he d- it mimes a dance <laughs> so good all of the stuff Ron, around the yule ball in this movie is spectacularly fantastic Ron, and well done <laughs> ron ron trying to recreate it like and trying to do the mime as well like the way they that is a perfect adaptation of that moment for yeah. movie they've made yeah. it they've made it more visual yeah. they've made it more uh, funny. They've actually like uh, look. Some of the humor in this film doesn't land too much. Like the like the asking Cho Chang out dance. I for to the dance. I don't think that that works as well because they've kept the joke, but the the delivery has changed in a way. But I have to say, the humor in general in this film, even if the jokes don't sometimes land, it is very consistent. There is a consistent humorous tone that, to be fair, right. does then sort of change. At the end, with the with the with the Voldemort return scene, so I think that's quite impressive. One other thing about the dance, I'll just say, because um, I think this film came out before Half Blood Prince book came out. Um, I, I even really enjoyed all the weird, <laughs> like, are they suggesting Ginny and Neville are going to get together? Like they're slow dancing. Neville's like, I've just come in. Me, like all of that stuff. I even really last part of you's like, but Ginny's meant to be with Harry. Um, all of that stuff is done very well. I think you're right to say that, um, or I, I agree with you rather that all of the Yule Ball stuff is great. I think the it is indicative of the book and the film, though, that this film feels slightly section by section. <laughs> we have the World Cup. We have the, right. the stuff of leading up to the first task. We have the first task. We have the Yule Ball. We have the second task. We have the third task, and we're done. Um, but that is, yeah. Th- this is That's a problem, inherited. though, in general, when adapting these books. Yeah. And I think there's the reason we've always indicated, whether live-action or animated, we've always said these books would better suit a television adaptation. 
Um, mm. And I stand by that. And I think it's because to create the feeling of a year passing every year, the books do a very good job of segmenting the year into the problem that was most prominent for Harry in that moment. So that leads the books to feeling a bit segmented. There's a section of the year when he is not talking to Ron. And it's a problem for him throughout that period of time. And they talk, the, he talks in the book about, they, 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 I can't, yeah, about how, how, you know, how he finds himself missing Ron. And, and, and you know, uh, you, you know, life isn't quite as fun when Hermione's your best friend is basically the implication mm. that they put in. Because she's a little bit more study heavy and a little bit more straight laced. And, you know, he misses that part of the, that. You know, the reason their trio works is because they each bring something different to it that's important, but all one or all the other would be a bad thing. And they explore that, and that's really nice. And there's a section of the book where, um, you know, the whole school hates Harry because of the, they, the, 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 the perceived arrogance, uh, which is then exasperated by Reed Skeeter. And there's a whole section of the book when things start to turn around for him, where after the dragon task, people sort of, like Ron, forgive him, you know, Rita Skeeter stuff sort of starts to dwindle and cause less problems for Harry and starts to cause more problems for Hermione. And so each section of the book is like, it's to, 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 to show time passing, the problems that are, 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 Harry is, is experiencing just shift as the year goes on. Uh, to do that in a movie means you get these weird segmented stories. And that's why I was like, maybe be braver with the Ron stuff and act like that happened for a lot more of the year than it did in the book. Because then you actually have more time to explore it because you've only got, you know five minutes per uh, per you know per month in a year or whatever to actually like explore this in the film so maybe just make it make it take longer make it last longer so you, a higher percentage of movie can explore that idea uh, because otherwise the whole movie feels this it's very it structurally is very segmented and um it, yeah it doesn't isn't that cohesive i think that's one of the reasons chamber is so far one of the most successful ones because it has a story that pretty much ebbs and flows across a year so it's all one story shifting rather than lots of little stories breaking out and as a result it makes for a way more cohesive single film than the rest of them did so uh, yeah I think that's a real that's a real um, it, it's no one's fault as such I just think if maybe you made bolder choices as a, as a writer on a movie like this to, to, to restructure the Hogwarts year you it would be different to the book and some people might complain about that but you might actually end up with a better movie so yeah yeah i'd say so who were the before we forget who were the weird sisters so the weird sisters were played by um pulps jarvis cocker as correctly identified by chris and radiohead's johnny greenwood um oh and phil selway from radiohead so it was it was it was three people but it wasn't pulp radiohead and blur it was pulp and two from radiohead so there you go cool cool um yeah i think that's um that's all done really well. Um, the I think. Do we think the Yule Ball stuff? Oh, and I completely agree with everything you've just said about a need to be a bit braver, really. And and the thing to focus in on, I think, is the character stuff. Um, mm-hmm. You know, make more of Ron and Harry falling out. Um, make more, maybe of um, maybe more of Ron and Hermione, but more of oh. more of like Cedric's death and yeah. Or oh, cut them. Not such as death, but like, mm. if you're not going to make Ron and Harry's falling out a huge part of this movie and this story, don't include it. I wouldn't Honestly, be sat think... there going, didn't they fall out in the book? <laughs> We'd be focusing I... on the plot and Harry's anxiety facing the dragon and all that stuff. That's fine. That's enough. <laughs> I think I'd have done that. I think I'd have opted for that. I'd have gone, you know what? Let's not include this because it's not gonna. It's not necessary for the wider story. Even in the books, it sort of gets forgotten about. It, it's passable in the books because it's interesting, and also it, you, the build yeah. up for, to that fight has happened in more than just that book. Yeah. It's the build and up it, across the it first. It tells three. you a lot about the but, characters, but it, in, in yeah. this shortened form, it tells you nothing about anyone because they've butchered it. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to do? Uh, let's do a little one, Dan. A little, but it is a criticism again. I feel like I should give another compliment. Um, but let's but the, talk. But about the movie Dan. is mostly shit. Yeah, go on. <laughs> let's talk about Mad Eye Moody and his camera eye. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sorry. I'll just, again. I'll just read you. I'll just read you the note as I wrote it. This, this is my immediate reaction. The second. We cut to the visual of his camera eye going. That fucking robot noise on his eye. Dot, dot, dot. 
fuck off. That's what I wrote. Yep. Yep. It just doesn't make any sense. Like, mm. it it doesn't... It's not a... That is not a... It's not that in the book thing. That's a... In this world of magic, <laughs> it doesn't make sense that his eye is a technological thing and a technological thing very much build it, build, um, building off of muggle technology. It just makes no sense. It's, it's literally described it. as a magical eye. It is magical. That is its point. So it doesn't go... Zzz, 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 because it's fucking magic. You want to do another another little one? Go on. Bye. Barty Crouch isn't really a man that's tortured in this movie, is he? And he is, you know, regardless... Well, I suppose in this in this movie, he doesn't know wow. his son's missing from Azkaban? Well, we Maybe. don't know his son... We don't know what happened with his son. We don't, we don't know if his son escaped years ago and has been on the run, or they yeah. thought his son was dead. They, they never clarify uh, what the situation that case, with his son was. But here's the thing. In that case... Go on. Yeah, go on. Well, you, you no, were you saying go. in that case. I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, I was just going to say, in that case, I actually put, alongside um, Brian Gleeson, I actually, because because we don't know what's going on with him, and it could be, like you say, that his son escaped years ago or whatever, actually, I'd put Roger Lloyd Pack in the category with Brian Gleeson of, they're doing a fucking wonderful job with what they've got. Barty Crouch's enthusiasm... Huh? You mean Brendan Gleeson, I assume. Brendan, sorry, yeah, that's, yeah, mate, yeah. there's like fifty glee. There's like no, no, that's fine. Glee. I just no, I, that um, was for my <laughs> own benefit to understand which actor you're referring to. That wasn't, yeah. that wasn't looking for a correction. I just genuinely <laughs> was thinking, who's fucking Brian Gleeson? Like, for all I know, Brian <laughs> Gleeson is like an actor that plays another small part in this movie that I've missed. Brendan, sorry, yes. Brendan, Brendan the actor Brendan that plays Gle- Mad Eye Moody, Brendan Gleeson. Yes, carry on. Brendan Gleeson, Roger Lloyd Pack, and of course Ralph Fiennes are three additions to this movie, delivering wonderful performances that scene where barty crouch talks about you know we we don't know what we've got until it's kind of lost is a really nice you know lovely scene obviously ralph fines is electric like those three actors in particular in terms of new cast are just absolutely phenomenal in this film uh, brendan gleason as well gets my favorite joke in the movie and it's directly from the book but it doesn't matter it's moody what are you doing Teaching! And he's just bouncing Ferret Malfoy up and down. It's so good. It's so, so good. Um, on the subject of Barty Crouch, though, I've got a question for you, Chris. Mm. So you're running um, a, 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 a tournament at your school, yeah? And it's it's been run in conjunction with the ministry. You're, you're the headmaster, you're Dumbledore. Just imagine you're Dumbledore in this situation, right? And there's and and, and you've got to deal with the ministry that you're going to hold this tournament. And the, the head of magical cooperation, who's a, a big department at the ministry, is regularly at the school helping sort all this out. But simultaneous to that, you've had terrorist attacks on a recent event run by the same man, <laughs> actually, um, over the summer. Your responsibility is to the school, presumably, right? Then one of the kids randomly gets put in without having done it themselves. And you believe that because you're Dumbledore, right? You believe when Harry says no, even though you asked him in an insane way. We'll come back to that. Then the head of magical cooperations and games is found dead on your grounds. And you don't cancel the final part of the tournament? <laughs> What, well what do you done. do, Chris? You find you well find the done. head of magical games and corporations dead on your grounds with all of that other information that's just occurred. What's your next step? Because it isn't fucking hold the end of the tournament, that's for sure. But the tournament tournament's begun, Dan. It's got to be done. Why is it got to be done? Don't know. But it's got to be done. It's magically <laughs> binding. <laughs> it's magically binding, my friend. Well, let's... I cannot believe. Like it says a lot about our feelings of this movie. That we're an hour and ten minutes into this and we've not even got to Dumbledore said calmly. Well, because that's the thing is the Dumbledore said calmly isn't even like like because okay because even if I just go along with the logic for we used earlier for Crumb like this is just a different interpretation of Dumbledore. Fine, it's annoying because it doesn't even fit with the first two movies. But let's just say we've, we're recharacterizing the ones. It's a different approach. Fine, you've made a different creative decision. What I can't fucking stress out stress enough is that in a movie that already has no chill. <laughs> Because every 10 seconds, there's a cannon going off or a Weasley having a fight and everyone going, Rah! 
<laughs> it's the most like stressful movie just to watch because it's just noise and sounds and lights all of the time. The, it's just it, it, it won't linger anything for more than ten seconds before something boisterous happens. We then have <laughs> we then have Dumbledore, <laughs> who could be the one catalyst for like a calm, sensible human being in this insane world, starting a speech by going. I have two words for you. Eternal glory! What? <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> when, did sh- when did Dumbledore get so dramatic? <laughs> what's, what's happened here? Why does... The movie has no chill. Dumbledore has no chill. What is going on? And that's before we get to fucking... There's a bunch of him in the goblet, Harry! Shaking him to death. <laughs> he said calmly... It's fucking look. I just I, I said it once. I'll say it again. I'll say it every fucking podcast we do until the end. Fuck Michael Gambon's performance. It's awful on every level. <laughs> he, every choice he makes is wrong, and his whole attitude of is nah. I did my own thing. I didn't bother reading the book. Fuck you. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just. I, what, you, what is so... this fucking? Honestly, though, this movie is. Do you agree with that though? That that the tone of this movie is mm. stressful. It's constantly. Oh, yeah. oh, it's... No moment is allowed to exist without a cannon going off or a fight breaking out or the whole school jumping up. I mean, yeah, you know, it's just constant noise and movement and things happening. And I just, it's so much. Like I was longing for, like you know, that scene we talked about in Chamber of Secrets that was cut from your version but was in mine, where Harry just sat on the on the hill talking a Hedwig. <laughs> and then yeah, I just thought, yeah. if they put that scene in this movie, it would be interrupted by a cannon going off and the Weasley twins rolling out of a bush punching each other. <laughs> well, I did enjoy that age scene. Like, the age line scene with those two, I did uh, I did enjoy. But yeah. yet, there's just no... There's no pace. The, the, there's no moment to reflect. Even moments like... Uh, like, the, like, he finds... I've just got it up now... He finds him in the forest, dead, I believe. Is that yeah, he finds Barty Crouch dead. That could be a real sombre moment. No, he's in the pensive. He's he's in a busy court yelling about Snape and and Death Eaters and stuff like that. That's he's the out the pensive. We've got you know, we're immediately in the third task. It's it's just such a it's such a speed. And it feel, for the amount they've cut, it feels they basically I think a kind of overarching thing that we're saying here is for all they the good they've done cutting some stuff some of the stuff they have kept in for the sake of keeping it in because it's in the book is damaging to the pacing and character well, work and if you get rid of some of that stuff and take the time instead to flashing it fleshing out the character work you'd end up with a much better paced movie well uh, yeah and on top of that that's a problem created by a change that I do not understand why they made. So, uh, push his glasses up nose in the book. Say it with me. Barty isn't found dead. He is found raving in mm. the forest. Harry runs to get Dumbledore, and when they get back, he is gone. What we find out later is he was then murdered and hidden by um, Junior. Now, the reason that's the way it is in the book is because, obviously... If you found the guy organising the event dead in the forest when there's already a bunch of suspicious shit going on, you would just not do the event, right? But instead, in the movie, they create more problems by having Harry found him, finding him dead. Why not have Harry find him babbling about Voldemort and his son and not being coherent and Harry being like, something's fucking wrong here, like, I'm going to go get help. Uh, running off to get help, coming back in, he's gone. How much longer would that take... Yeah, and this Dumbledore, this 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 Dumbledore's mad. I mean, you have Harry turn to Dumbledore and go, "What what could that be about, Professor?" I mean, obviously a, a better written line. And then we cut to them in the pensive together, and it's just in the movie. This version of Dumbledore is answering that question by showing him what happened in the pensive. Well, that's you the know? other thing. The pensive. Oh, sorry, did you call it a pensive, Chris? Don't you mean the pensive? <laughs> I do. Because in this movie, they pronounce it wrong the entire time. It's a pensive. Everyone. Oh, did I actually? I just assumed then I pronounced something incorrectly again. Did no, I actually get it no, right no. in the movie? You got it right. You called it a pensive, which is what it is and how it is pronounced and how it's always been pronounced. <laughs> and I do not understand what the choice was for this movie to call it a pensive. The pensive, Harry. Um, 
it's, it, and then also, oh, for another subject of the, the choices Dumbledore's making and just ignoring, there's a scene in this movie where the teachers basically acknowledge that Harry's name being included means there's some sort of plot going on that's going to be a threat to them, and they decide to just leave Harry in the tournament anyway, on the grounds that, and I'm not quoting, but this is a, I'm paraphrasing, it'll draw him out. They're basically going to use Harry as bait to draw out whatever this plan is. They say that out fucking loud. And then the way the movie acknowledges that is at one point towards the end of the movie, Dumbledore says to Harry, really sorry, Harry, about that thing where we used you as bait. <laughs> it's one line at the end where Dumbledore's like, Soz, bro. Anyway, did you put your name in the goblet, Harry? Like, <laughs> eternal glory! <laughs> what is this fucking movie? It's a bad movie, Chris. Yes. <laughs> Let's well, let's well, Dan. Let's play it some. Let's pay it some compliments. Yeah. Um, suffers a bit from some of the stuff we've been talking about. The worm tail of it all is dealt with very quickly. But mm-hmm. in general, the graveyard resurrection of Voldemort stuff is is brilliant. Yes. Yeah. Mainly, uh, with, with, mainly with the because of Ralph exception Fox. of the fact we don't then get the the explanation of Priory and Cantatum, which comes later. But the actual scene in itself, in isolation is a very good interpretation, I think, of that sequence. And yeah. it doesn't have the tone the rest of the movie has. It has the tone it needs, which is dark and serious and upsetting. And, and I even like, and some people I've seen criticize this, the, the, the frivolous way in which Cedric is killed. It's not a hero's death. Now, that's the point, I think. That was a choice. It's a choice in the book. It's a choice here. Kill the spare. Poof, gone. That's, yeah. that's powerful really well done um and i really actually like the way as well they visualized and i know it's written this way in the book so this is exactly what the book says but just seeing harry leap on the body and then summon the the cup so that it hits his hand and then they just vanish the way it's done because in the book when you read it in a sentence and it's describing the action that's longer than seeing it play out so i always had my thought in the when i read the book version of like was there not enough time here for voldemort to stop him from doing this but the film, I think, does it just right, where he like leaps and basically at the same time axios the the cup, and it all sort of the the the, the cup, him and Cedric's body all collide together at the same moment. We'll say though, selfish move, Cedric. Um, Harry's life is still on the line here. Telling him to bring back his body, selfish. Harry, prioritize yourself, please. Get home safe. Would be a less dickish yeah, thing to say. I've... That's from Unless the book too. That's from the book too. But yeah. Yeah. No. No. I know. I wasn't going to say that. Unless he's thinking of his father and knowing that he'll. No. Need he is. He's one hundred percent thinking of his father. It's still or... selfish, though. That's Harry's. Yeah. Harry's. Harry could die trying to retrieve his body. It would be quicker for Harry just to axio the fucking cup. Yeah. 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 Dick move, yeah. Cedric. The... Dick move. I thought the the. Given how they don't have a lot of time to do the the cool kind of scene in the book where it's like, oh crab, right, crab and Goyle are Death Eaters too, and the I thought dedicating time to the Lucius stuff was very good. Um, I thought that was acted well. And they, and they well do by, name Crab and Goyle, I think, and they do name them, yeah. So you mm-hmm. do still get that that buzz in general. In that scene, Ralph Fiennes is just incredible. I found, by the way, I found the scene. I found the quote. Uh, <laughs> I put you in terrible danger this year, Harry. I'm sorry. There you <laughs> it's go. It's Dumbledore's. It's Dumbledore's explanation for that. Um, but you know what? The grave scene, uh, the the color palette in this film <laughs> so good. is. You know, there's a there's a lot of kind of golden hues and stuff throughout the film. There's a lot yep. of kind of uh, relatively for the sort of later, more muted films. There's a lot. Of, there's a fair amount of bright colors in this film. So the decision from a kind of cinematography point of view. To, to to go really down to to like those green muted colours for the graveyard scene. Um and even actually that cinematography extends to the forest scene as well, although I don't like the forest scene as much. Um is is wonderful. You know, not shying away from this was the first PG thirteen film in the US and was it a, a two, was it twelve in the UK? I don't know, maybe that's in the drift. Um things like the it's body not, I can, I can find out. 
the body being dropped into the cauldron like it's really haunting they really the worm tail of it all and him getting his hand and like yeah like timothy spool just beautifully chewing the scenery like so much of that last sequence that last that sorry specifically the resurrection scene is is brilliant um and done really well and actually the the reveal scene of mad eye moody and the build to that and you know they do something which isn't in the books which is actually really kind of haunting and clever and a really good adaptation move where you have harry say i don't think i mentioned the graveyard professor and then at that point i think we could probably get to him because at that point he's already sort of he's already um deforming slightly because he's run out of polyjuice potion so i don't like that they sort of make him drink a potion and then he forms into batty barty crouch i'm like you've literally embedded into the scene that he's running out of time and is about to transform um, back so why I, don't you just I have mis- him transform I could be, back i could be misinterpreting chris but I, i'm pretty sure the serum they give him isn't to turn him back he does turn back because he's a run truth out. potion I think it's the Veritas serum, so he tells the truth. I don't think that is what reveals his physical form. I think it's just a coincidence that filmmaking-wise, those two moments have lined up. Um, I would have maybe had him turn back first and then had them give him the Veritas serum to make that clearer. Um, from a filmmaking yeah, because also, but I just I I wouldn't have bothered with the serum. I think because I've got it here. I don't think he says too much. Like he's already basically said it to Harry. Um, like I've got it here to see what he actually he's doing that weird tongue thing oh yeah that's a fucking choice isn't it Jesus so apparently it was that. Tennant that chose to do that and Brendan Gleeson got wind that they were doing it and was like you know what I can we can make that we can make that a thing so yeah I just I don't like it <laughs> <laughs> like, I I get it's quite effective as a hint you know when Brendan Gleeson does it and mm-hmm. Barty Crouch's eyes lit up um, yeah, with the truth serum, he's basically he shows him his arm. We see Harry's arm, and then he says he's back. He doesn't actually sort of give any expositional stuff, so there was no need for him to kind of have the truth serum. So I think he should have just, yeah, exactly. He, I'll be welcome back like a hero. He doesn't actually Don't reveal give anything. anything away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. And also, I also how much more effective we've already had. The scene of Snape and the other headmaster in a little room looking at each other. Man, ha- the I'll show you mine if you show me yours. How much more effective would that have been if that was directed to Snape instead of Harry? And this weird, like, we don't really explain the cut of the arm and the blood and what that means in that moment. So why does Harry need to show his arm in that moment, which Dumbledore grabs aggressively? Because mm. Dumbledore grabs everything aggressively in this movie. Like, I think it would have been so much more effective if David Tennant, if, sorry, if Barty Crouch Jr. had looked at Snape and said that. Yeah, I mean, there's so many things yeah. around that they could have done differently. And that's, yeah, that's definitely one of them. Because um, it, 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 it's, it's just... <laughs> Just don't maybe don't include the 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 the, 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 the because the, to be honest with you the, the 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 dark mark as a tattoo thing is is a is a weird thing to do anyway because um, it's it, you're essentially like you know oh you want to be a teacher at uh, Hogwarts so uh, just check your arm please make sure you're not a death eater <laughs> like <laughs> the idea that like everyone is branded with that that worked for him is kind of like ah. Uh... That causes that 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 causes more problems than it solves anyway. Just in a wider world situation, like um, so, I I, I don't. I, why couldn't they just not have that? Uh, there's no need for that to be in the movie. That's mm. another thing that's like there because it's in the book, um, not because it needs to be there to be tell tell this story. Do you? I take it you agree about um, the the resurrection of Voldemort scene being uh, well, just awesome. Yeah, it's very good. I mean, I think it's mostly sold by like you know Ralph Fiennes being extraordinary yes, and, yeah, and, and i will say as scenes go it's it's written reasonably well it plays out pretty much as it does in the book but it's 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 yeah it's pretty good it's it, it's it's menacing and it's upsetting and you know the weird little demon thing baby voldemort thing is pretty creepy to look at and uh you know the the the, the way in which he's menacing to his own people really gives you a sense of how much of a villainous character he is the choice not to give him the red Snake eyes is a good choice because I think Fines gives a really good performance through his eyes. So not mm-hmm. to completely stick with the with the book interpretation is a good thing here. Um, I do think 
because of the way it's structured, um, a non-book reading audience member might think the reason he looks all fucked up is because of the resurrection rather than the Horcrux stuff, because obviously we've only ever seen him young and handsome, so it, it almost looks like he's all weird and not got a nose because this went wrong somehow. So I, I could I, I wouldn't be surprised to like if you know to have been a fly on the wall for conversations as people were leaving the theatre for this back in the day and hearing someone say something like, Why wasn't he more mad at Wormtail for like fucking up his resurrection? <laughs> he used to be like a handsome dude. <laughs> Like, what happened? Um, but, you know, fine. Like, well, you know, that's just structure. I don't know what else you can do other than, like, showing scenes in between where you could see him becoming more snake-like. And I guess you could always save that for later on. Because we, we, you know, we, we know why he's all fucked up and snake-like, but the, I guess yeah. the audience generally wouldn't. Um, but, yeah, I, I, on the whole, we, I think it's a, it's a really good effect. The very minimalist makeup, but it works really well. Apparently, Ralph Fiennes shaved his head for that. Very impressive. Um, you know, to to go to that trouble to to, to actually you know bulge yourself in order to uh, you know take on the makeup for the role, but it's very minimalist, but it works really well. It's very effective, and he's he's great in it. And and I I, do, I enjoy that they do all the stuff with him being angry at his own people for not coming after him, uh, particularly Lucius. Although, I mean, Lucius, mate, don't bother with the mask, mate. Your hair's all sticking out from under your hood. It's pretty fucking clear who it is. Tuck the fucking I, hair I really, into the hood, you, you prick. Like, what are you I doing? Really, I really liked. I went, I thought, oh, good movie. You're not dumbing down the audience by making this a reveal. It's clear it's Lucius, even though he's got the mask. Good on you. And then, like, two minutes later, the or two, 20 seconds later, the mask comes off in sort of almost a grand reveal moment. And I'm like, oh, fuck you, movie. Yeah. Um, do you want, before we do, before we do the questions and then Triv, you want another, you want another quick one, Dan? Another sure. little quick one? It's a weird fucking moment, isn't it? The whole world's going to change now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> like, is it a joke? Is it? Is it? Is it meant to be humour? Is it meant to be a piece of like? Does it? Is it meant to represent Harry's acknowledgement of the world and just kind of blunt determination? Like, what? What? What's that about? It's weird, isn't it? <laughs> weird, <Yeah>. totally. <laughs> Yeah, I don't really know what they're getting out of that either. I was kind of like, what? It's just like, I, I guess they're just, like, it's just a quick way to establish the problem of Voldemort returning, but, like, I, I it doesn't really... Also, I, I, I will say that's not helped by, I think it's probably Emma Watson's worst delivered line in the, these movies so far. Um, I don't know what yeah. happened that day, if they just threw that line at a last minute, like, because they'd realised they hadn't really established that Voldemort returning was bad for the wizarding world at large. I, I, I don't know. They were, uh, yeah, yeah, or setting up the next movie, perhaps, which is why they also have that. You will write, won't you? Because it's like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've got some plot points. Like, uh, yeah, there's a million of things wrong with that moment, but what, one of them not being that it's, it's delivered very poorly. But yeah, it's it is strange. I kind of accept it though. Something like that that's kind of like quick. At least it's there. They, at least they put some thought into it. But yeah, it's a strange exchange. Um, yeah, because it could have been more. I think the note of the note of them all, although we've not really seen any evidence of it throughout any other point in the movie, but the note of it, it's a wider community. They've all made friends. You could have easily the dialogue could have been, "It's great to see you know the schools have truly merged. Well, we we now need our community more than we've ever needed them before." Yeah, you know, shit's about to go down. Yeah, but we've got each other. That, that could have been really the note. do need. You do need. The Durmstrangs and the Bobatons showing up for the Battle of Hogwarts in the in the final movie. Ah, oh, but do that in the movie. How cool would that have been? I know it's mm-hmm. not in the books, but fuck it, that would have mm-hmm. been brilliant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Ah, oh. yeah. oh, that's such an easy like because they don't. My memory of it is they don't really properly go into the giants and stuff. So instead of the giants rushing in to help, you know, seeing that ship that we've seen in this movie that looks awesome. And a lot of this movie actually looks awesome, you know. The, the yeah, the, the, it's it's not got great. the um, it's not got the filmic like auteur quality that we had from the last one, but it's there are some yeah. really brilliant shots, you know, framed in front of archways with things flying in front of them, and like just some really really nice, just you know, they're not really telling us anything. 
but they're just really nice to look at and impressive. So there's a gr- there's a lot of that, you know. Um, we we don't get anything as artistic as the flowers around Hogwarts all dying as the Dementors float over them, which is is you know telling us a bit something about the tone of the place and the, 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 those creatures. But yeah, it's instead you know we here we just get some very nice visuals, but they're they're good. They're, so yeah, they 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 you know they're they're kind of often meaningless, but they're they're really neat. So the DOP. Mm. Set designers, like the, uh, art, art design department, whoever is responsible for figuring all that stuff out, did a did a really good job. Good job. Um, should we do? Should we do questions, my friend? Well, I, I've got a couple of quick little tiny notes for myself. Might as well get these out of the way before we do the questions. Yeah, the man. questions are the questions are big. So, um, did, did, did no one try to stop the Death Eaters at all? They they just they just they just trashed the Quidditch World Cup, destroyed thousands of tents, and presumably hurt lots yeah. of people. Like I don't want to, you know, be like an in the book, but in the in the in the book, there's there's a handful of them, just a couple of them. They start trying to talk to muggles, and then the, the ministry show up, and then we don't see how it plays out. But the place isn't like a burning, smouldering, apocalyptic mess when it's finished, which is what happens here. And I don't really understand why. Did did literally no one like no 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 authorities anywhere. And in, in a world where some of the wizards, you know, most of the wizards are good, they also just left a teenage boy lying on the ground, did they? <laughs> yeah. Like, like, it feels so weird, weird that a whole thing of like hundreds, maybe thousands of wizards, no one fought back. Strange. Mm. Anyway, um, I do think that the, 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 the Quidditch se- sequence does introduce us to a lot of characters, so I guess it's important why it's there, but uh, yeah, where's the Quidditch? We've already talked about that, but yeah, Cedric, Karam, Death Eaters, and Barty Crouch are all introduced in that segment, so I guess you can't really cut it, but anyway. Uh, I was thinking another, be... another, another oh. reason, this another reason this series would be so much better as a, as a TV show, because it's a TV show specifically made now where we know where it all goes. Can you imagine a TV show version of this and you know, as they're walking through the crowd, someone says, "Oh, why's why's Umbridge got a stick up her nose, or something like like? Do you know what I mean? The teasing you could do of the characters that are to come in the Quidditch World Cup scene, oh, would have been great. But it would be great because I think you know it may well happen someday. But yeah, amazing." Um, Polyjuice potion doesn't work the same in this movie as it did in the last one uh, that they used it in, um, and I don't know why. Well, I do, because it's, it's cleaner. But basically, Harry and Ron had to put on Crab and Gore's voices because it didn't change their voices. Um, whereas Polyjuice Potion seems to work fully in this movie and changes his voice too. Um, I don't mind pick a lane, either one, but do it consistently throughout all of your movies, please. Would be nice. Um, port keys work differently to they do how they work in the book, but that's also fine because they're consistent within this movie. Just want to bring, bring that up. Because there's a point when someone yells, get back to the port key. Like, oh, it's still sat there. And if you touch it, it'll take you back to where you started. Fine. Whatever. Uh, the movie moves at a mile a minute. Dermstrang and Bobaton are introduced so quickly and so suddenly. <laughs> um, also, obviously, then... Oh, and, I'm, and, and I'm sorry badly as well. Jess didn't mind it. Jess was like, yeah, but when you've got like 10 seconds to visually introduce a group of people, you know, the dance and the stuff, it's a bit cheesy, but... It well, is clearly it is clearly doing a purpose, but I just didn't like it. I was just well, like, also because like you just get the feeling like so they come, they do the the, the, the Bobaton girls do this dance, this big elaborate dance. But there's like one girl that comes in doing backflips, and I'm just I just remember, <laughs> just remember thinking, do they just bring her for the backflips? Like it, maybe she's not actually well, participating in the, you know, she won't be uh, applying for the for the <laughs> for the for the toy. Well, I don't I, I don't think she is. So I think I could be wrong. Because I thought that at first, but I think that girl is Fleur's sister. So the reason she's a bit separate is because, and the reason she's there for the backflips is she's too young to apply for the tournament, but you've got a set up that she's there. So I'm pretty sure the one who's dressed differently is and does the backflips is Fleur's sister. I, I mean, might be wrong. No, no, it but could she be. joins up she and called, she like joins Gabriella up or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah I, she joins up and holds hand with holds hands with Fleur at the end of the dance. So, well, there you go. Um, yes, I. I don't even. Yeah, all right, fine. Um, what's the mind, magical binding contract with the the thing? Why does why is that a requirement? I don't know. 
why is it a thing that Harry has to do? We already talked about that, but it's, it's in my notes multiple times because there's so many points. Oh, Hermione yelling, I'm not an owl. Dumb line. Dumb line. <laughs> Just why is that in the movie? Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Um, scoring. Let's let's talk about this. Um, it, it, we get some real issues with this movie with the with the with the with the Triwizard Tournament because there's no indication of scoring or a table league table happening at any point until right before the final task when we when we are suddenly told that Harry and Cedric are tied. Are they? Yeah, Cut that that's line out set the movie. Up, I believe. That, no, that, believe, that raises more questions than it solves. <laughs> I believe they at least... I don't think that's the first reference to it, though. I'm pretty sure at the end of the second task, we're told they're tied. Because Hag, they, they oh, show no, we're, Harry we're told, we're told that Harry is second for that task. That's yes, right. Yeah, yeah. But we're not told about an overall score. But the, the problem is, referencing scoring at all just raises questions. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, suddenly Harry and Cedric are tied on points. They're on points. There are points when, like, this is mm. the problem. Yeah, okay. We find out that Harry came quote unquote second in the second task, but we didn't find out how well he did in the first one. And then they're talking about being tied on points in the yeah. third one. Yeah. Point. Yeah. What points? Yeah. 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 No. Absolutely. Um, what's What's the deal with Harry suddenly becoming a weird showman, throwing himself a little party for catching, getting the egg? And be like, who wants to see me open it? I didn't hear you. Oh, who wants to I see me open that. it? Because what what's extra annoying about that is, in the book at least, in the book, that whole thing comes after Harry and Rod have made up. To mm-hmm. have him be like that when he's still fighting with Ron, and, you know, he is being the thing he's... Acu- like, do you know what I mean? Their whole thing after is, you know, oh, essentially, you're not really like that. It's like, what well, he fucking is in this moment. He has been for the last half an hour while he's been, you know, glugging down pumpkin juice and doing his showboating. Like, that really... It really annoyed me that, A, it just felt out of character. Felt even more out of character when you realise it's taking place before he's even made up with Ron. Let alone the fact that Ron in the stands, all pretense have gone, and Ron is just, like, supporting Harry in the stands. <laughs> like, so, you know, they've just forgot... It's like they forgot about the fight from the minute hit Harry's about to enter the task and then went, oh, we should probably chuck in an apology scene. All right, yeah, let's do it mm. there. Um... Yeah, uh, I don't like the comedic version of Snape in this movie, by the way, where he's all beating them around the head with the book. It's a funny scene, but make that Same, any other teacher. Like that. Yeah, it doesn't work. Well, it just um, felt like they were like, oh, we should probably give Snape something to do. We've yeah. cut most of his stuff. Uh, which I, I, yeah. I, I do, though, however, enjoy McGonagall and her entire reaction uh, to Harry and Ron before the Yule Ball, which is like to make fun of, to indirectly make fun of Ron's robes. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Harry's like she's like Harry did I tell you that you need to be the first one dancing he's like uh, no professor you didn't say that she goes ah well you know now uh, it's so good <laughs> yeah that. and her whole and her whole put your hand on my waist Weasley where <laughs> like yeah, in yeah. And all, all that's quite fun but that's all connected to the part of the movie that does work which is as we've already established like the Yule Ball stuff um, yeah. I want slight criticism and I get why they did it but why show Harry's reaction to Hermione entering not Ron's um, we see Ron later, but it's a much less emphasis put on it. I think it would be more important to have Ron yeah, that's, being the one turn that's... around Jora Gape as she comes down the stairs, but maybe that's just me. That's slightly inherited from the book, but I think they should have, for the purpose of the film, changed it. Because in the book, he just walks past Hermione, and you right. don't know whether he's realised and is so annoyed that he's just ignoring it, or whether he's she's looks so different he's not realised yet. We don't really get Ron's reaction in the book either, but I think for the purpose of the film, especially given where the scene goes, we should have probably got Ron's reaction. Yeah, I would agree. Um, hate that they call the Great Lake the Black Lake. Mm. Don't, unnecessary just, change. Just a really unnecessary change. It's, just, it's the forbidden forest, the dark forest all over again. I don't know why. Um, right, Dumbledore's... Is, okay, Dumbledore's office... They're in there. Dumbledore's like, whatever you do, Harry, don't touch those sweets. They snap or whatever. And then Harry does it anyway because he's a fucking idiot. And that's fine. That's a teenager will do the thing you've told them not to do immediately every time. So that's fine. I'm not against that as a, as a thing. But then Harry stumbles back and it's what reveals the, pens- the pensive to him. Question, Chris. Was that some sort of weird Dumbledore plan? And 
you know, to get Harry to see the pensive and, and go into it and see the, the, the memories. Don't know. Because he, he says it he in knows. a sort of like knowing way. And if that was yeah, his plan, it's, it's a terrible plan because it one relies on Harry immediately ignoring him, and two it relies on Harry being bitten in a way that forces him to fall back into the shelf that then opens it, and then that, there's a lot of coincidences would need to happen for that plan to be anything but not happening. It's weird. Yeah, because he almost he almost winks when he tells him. But I did he, I did in general quite like that moment because I like when these films add magical texture and that idea of those sweets is mm-hmm. a fun magical texture thing that doesn't come from the books which I quite liked. Yeah. Um glad we don't introduce Bellatrix here. She's introduced at this stage in the bo- in the in the in the books. Um that would be a problem. There's just too much going on. Too many character introductions. Uh, it's probably wise. I just I, yeah, I think that's that works. Yeah. Um I like when they're in the maze Crumb finds Harry but then doesn't strike um because obviously that's a very good visual way of telling the audience or oh, cl- cluing the audience in that Crumb is is, like is part of the conspiracy to get Harry to the center of the maze. That's fine. I like that. Yeah. Um, yes, Harry saving Cedric is a pretty good moment, especially that I think I quite like the line that follows it, which is like you know uh, for a minute there I didn't think you were going to come back for me, and Harry's like you know what I wasn't sure I was going to either, <laughs> and that's pretty good. I enjoy that. Um, we talked about the rest of this. Uh. What did you think of the visual? Because obviously we'll touch upon this next week as well. Um, as I hinted at last week, there's a stark difference in the way faces in the fire appear in this film and the next one. What did you think of the visual of Sirius, but like he's covered in the, the embers and the ashes of the fire and it's like his face is pushing through it as if it was a fabric? I think it. I think it's fine. It's interesting. It certainly. It certainly feels... Okay, so there's, there's obviously two ways you could do this, and the other one is to have their face appear in flames through some Which sort I of... Which I think, if memory serves, yeah. is how it's done in the later movies. Uh, yeah, very well might be. I don't recall, but yeah, I, I, I wouldn't surprise me. I, I think the important thing would be to, to choose one and stick with it, but um, mm. I think it's good because it's super weird looking and way more interesting to me than a CGI flame that takes the shape of someone's face, like a sort of hologram from Star Wars, which is a visual we're kind of familiar with and know what looks like. This idea of the the embers taking like, you know, the, 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 the taking shape is actually pretty interesting visually. It's certainly not how I pictured it, but it certainly is it, it's more interesting to look at than the alternative. Um, so I think it works quite well. The only problem is it's kind of hard to tell who it is. If Harry didn't tell us, I wouldn't have known. Yeah, I th- I think the visual is really cool and it's very filmic and I like it for that reason. But in a world where you quite understandably cut a lot of the serious stuff from this movie and cut kind of Harry's aching to speak to him, I think that could have been a more personal tender moment had it been done face in the flames way. So I think it's mm. it's a cool visual, but it's still, it's not the decision I would have made had I been in charge, uh, which, you know, considering I was like 14, 15, would have been super nuts. But I, I think, yeah. I would, I would have maybe cut the scene altogether though, because they don't really use it to push the Ron stuff like it's done in the book. And it, we don't really gain anything from him talking to Sirius. Because in the in, in the book, well, the scene is used to tell, get, show us how anxious Harry is about the whole thing, and how anxious he feels about the dragon, and just like he just yeah, it's it's all very stressful for Harry. And really, it's the first moment we get where he kind of reveals all that. In the book, in the film, it's a lot more practical. You know, you know, what I think they could have done instead the the because I think you need Sirius in some form, especially given what happens in the fifth film and the fifth story. But maybe instead you don't you cut this scene, you don't have Sirius in this scene, but you have the dog be watching in the in the final task, and the last scene, Dumbledore or someone lets in the dog, and Harry's scene it's ha- it's dumb it's Sirius that tells him what the spell's called and and Sirius that has that moment of you saw James like you you know you you make it oh, a bit more nice. about and pun sorry. I said that that could have been really nice. Yeah, and you have them hug, and then the film. One of the last moments of this film is Harry feeling comforted because Sirius is there, 
and they can be together, which then helps all the stuff that comes in, yeah, in the next one. One thing they've kind of removed, which is like again, like it's like if you're gonna have serious, do it properly. There's a the, the, one of the stresses that Harry has in the book is that his worrying about his dreams and all the things that are going on and being in the Triwizard bring Sirius back to the country. Sirius had fleed and was in a tropical place and he comes back and that's a big stress for Harry because he feels like Sirius is putting himself at risk for him and he doesn't want that to be the case. Again, a really interesting thing to do to the character, but if you don't have time to do that, I don't know why Sirius is in this movie. Mm. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, or or sure. if you're going to put him in the movie, do what you've just suggested, Chris, which is give him a new purpose because you've removed the original one. So mm. give him a purpose that makes sense for the movie. And I think your, your example would have, would, have, would have worked just fine. Because um, I also get the impulse to not, not have him in it. You know, you've just established him as being part of Harry's life again. And you know he's going to be important down the line. So you need to make sure that you're establishing that relationship is becoming parent-child to a degree. You know, that mm. Harry is confiding in Sirius. You, you do need to have those moments. But it's just, it just doesn't, it doesn't really do anything else and i think the 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 genius of how it plays out in the book is that it's doing multiple things um and it it isn't here so yeah it's it feels Mm. far less useful as a scene yeah okay cool let's do the questions so uh question one does it work as a story on its own i think mostly yes if i'm being honest yeah it does yeah I think that there's, a, you know, the second part of the question, that is there a natural and logical sequence of events without the need for context of the books? Uh, no, <laughs> in, no, in several ways. But I think this story is broken even in the books. So uh, a lot of that is just inherited anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the actual, like, I think what they've done to the Barty Crouch plot to streamline it makes perfect mm. sense. Yeah, I'd agree. I think so. Um, can you see the seams of where things have been cut? I think we're going to, have to change this question because I think actually the question should be: Have they smoothed out the books? Uh, you know, choppy, choppy story because that's just how the book is. Into a single cohesive narrative. The answer in this case is no. No. Yeah. Absolutely no. Yeah, they failed. Um, Enough school in our wizard school movie? Absolutely no. Big no. Fat no. There is one and a half lessons. Two lessons in this movie. Um, the first is the, um, the Mad-Eye Moody lesson. And then the only other time we see them in a lesson, it's not even clear that it is indeed a lesson. It's, it's something with Snape, but it doesn't appear to be potions. No one has a cauldron. It also appears it's to be... It's in the Great in, Hall. It, yeah, I was going to say, it appears to be in the Great Hall... Because of what, like the setting, but like, is it an exam? Because Hermione finishes what she's doing and then hands it into Snape. It's very unclear what it is. Um, it, it, it's it's so it's one and a half because I don't think that's a proper lesson. I don't know what that is. So we see one lesson in this movie. That's insane. It is, but I do defend it a little bit as we did last week, which is there aren't many scenes that aren't set in lessons that could be transferred into lessons there's the the great hall weird scene there but otherwise it's a lot of tasks it's a lot of yule ball maybe there's a scene i'm just scanning through harry and hermione on the bridge talking maybe but then cedric needs to come along and say something to him and obviously he's in a different year so why doesn't the lesson finish they pack up and as they're heading out cedric comes over yeah yeah no 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 i i agree there's other ways you could get more literally of the school in um, I think you could get more of the school in easier than you could get lessons in per se. But also, also, do the do the Harry struggling to learn Axio? Uh, I understand that being cut. I I don't think that's. I think that doesn't go anywhere. Putting that in but, the film, but showing him. Pra- no, I, I I disagree. I think showing him practicing for that would help establish the stress as he feels as these events are coming. Like having the scene of him, just one scene, him and Hermione um, in the, 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 I think they find like an, a, like an, a disused classroom to practice. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And McGonagall stumbles across them and it's like, what the fuck are you doing? Um, I just think showing him learning it a bit. Look, essentially people, people describe this one as the sports movie. I, that's, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's the, what this movie is, but okay, fine. Then show him training. 
I don't. I, I actually think mm. if you're you want to establish that the thing that's on his mind, the thing that's the, the that's the through line of this movie is this tournament, and you don't want to make it seem schizophrenic. Like one minute all he cares about and all he's thinking about is the tournament, and the next minute it's completely forgotten. Because there's a point in the movie where I'd forgotten the Triwizard Tournament. Right after the Yule Ball, as the Yule Ball stuff was happening, it finishes with them on the bridge, and Hermione's like, have you solved that egg yet, Harry? I'm like, oh yeah, the egg, the tournament. That's happening. Showing him in between the tasks, worrying about the tasks, would improve this movie and make it feel more cohesive, in my opinion. Mm, yeah, no, I think that's fair. Mm. Um, so yeah, uh, there's not enough school in the movie, and even if... And the other way they could have had more school in it was to show him practicing. Uh, it wouldn't have been school, school, but it would have been related. And, it, and I, I would have felt happier about that. Hey ho. Uh, the final question, Chris, and the important one How is magic portrayed? Badly. What do you think? Yeah, we, we see some proper flashing gun ones uh, in it. We yeah, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of magic in it really. Like <laughs> so so yeah yeah. Uh, so th- there's a few. There's so there's the these the there's Moody doing all the magic to demonstrate the unforgivable curses, um, which I think is most mostly a good scene. But I really hate 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 how the Imperious Curse is displayed there because it doesn't look yeah. like he's made controlling the weird spider crab creature to make it run around doing things. It just looks like it works like Wingardium Leviosa <laughs> and he's floating the spider around to different places. Mm. It is not clear that it is a spell of control like that. He should have even, the spider even... on its own merit climb up people and hop off them and nearly jump into the cauldron and all that stuff. But even it, even how it's then represented with Crumb, this movie explains that it was people's excuses. In that scene with Moody, he talks about how people used it as an excuse mm-hmm. when he who you know when Voldemort was around. And then you look at the Crumb scene and go, "How the fuck was this anyone's excuse? Like, oh, it was uh, it was the curse where he controls me. Really? Because you weren't zombie like." Your eyes weren't misted over. Like, how the yeah. fuck was it that? <laughs> like, how is yeah. anyone able to perform this curse and not have anyone else notice? Yeah. Um, and also we have the typical Expelliarmus being constantly used to knock people on their asses, despite the fact that sometimes it's used correctly. Um, yeah. At one point... <laughs> okay, this could be debated, and I, I, I challenge anyone listening to go look at this scene and let me know what they think. But when um, Crouch Moody has Harry cornered, Dumbledore yells Expelliarmus, and then the door explodes off the hinges. (laughs) Now, it could be that someone separate to Dumbledore is blowing the door off the hinges, and Dumbledore is then yelling Expelliarmus to shoot a spell through to catch Moody, because that's then the spell that hits Moody. But it looks like... He yells, Expelliarmus. The door blows off its hinges as the spell bursts through, and then it collides with Moody and knocks him on his ass. Weird. Um, it's also used in the maze to knock someone on their ass as well, which is also not good. So, um... And so annoying when it's such an important spell in the series. <laughs> but, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, because I, mean, I, I don't mind it not knocking like Voldemort's wand out of his hand or whatever during the, the graveyard scene, because, you know... Voldemort's yelling Adabra Kedavra. Adabra Kedavra. I'll, 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 I'll try again later. That's not coming out of my mouth right now. Um, and Harry yells Expelliarmus. The two wands connect because of the cause, right? It's not... Mm. That's that, that, that be, The beam struggle, as it were, there is not really related to the well, spells either of them that's, cast. That's, what, so it, that's, that's what it is. It's not, that's not explained in the film, but yes, that is what it is. Right, but I'm, I'm like, we'll, we'll get that explained later. Well, will we though? Actually, that's a good point. I was thinking like, oh, maybe they'll explain that further down the line. They're not going to explain that now, are they? That's just going to have, ha- have happened. Yeah, you're right. Okay, well, dumb. But uh, yeah, well, yeah, okay, there you go. So is magic portrayed well in the movie? No, nothing's explained. <laughs> Nothing behaves consistently, no. as always. Um, the and, imperious and curse is, 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 you know, is badly demonstrated so that, that the audience will be confused as to how it works. There's, yeah, magic is not portrayed well in this movie. There's also, there's just not a lot of magic in it. There's not a lot of the equivalent of, like, in the last film, or it might have been The Chamber of Secrets, 
when they go to yeah, it would have been the well they did it to be fair, they did it in the leaky cauldron as well. The little no, the little nods, the the dishes that are washing themselves, the 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 cleaner that has a mop that's twirling all by itself. There's just not a lot of magic in the film. Um Yeah, it's a good so, point. So yeah, no, I don't think it's behave I don't think it's portrayed well. No, agreed. So Chris, unless you've got anything else to add, I think it's time. I think we can are we are we gonna do you wanna rank it and then do the triv or do the triv and then rank it? No, let's trip. Let's trip it up, and then uh, and then we'll rank it. Okay. Well, I'm gonna give you some trivia in that case. So uh, Alfonso Cuarón was offered the chance to direct this movie, um, but declined. Um, and initially, because he was just concerned he'd be still working on the. He didn't like the idea of being still working on the post production on Azkaban while starting pre and full production on this one. Um, so he was just like, nah. I guess at the time, maybe that was kind of like left open that he might come back for the one after, but obviously that never worked out either. Um, M. Night Shyamalan was also considered for this one, but turned it down. Another bullet dodged. Uh, two movies in a row, we've had it offered to M. Night, and he's not taking it. I'm relieved. Uh, one second, I'm going to. I've just realized I've started the trivia without my glasses on, Chris, and I can already see myself misreading something, so I'm going to do it now. Um, Mike Newell only received $1 million to direct this movie, and if you're wondering, why why did you use the word only there, Dan? Well, Chris Columbus got 10. <laughs> Plus a percentage of the gross. So, God, wow. So, uh, yeah, only $1 million does Mike Newell got screwed. Um... You know, as much as I'm not a huge fan of many of the choices made in this movie, and I do think he is to some degree to blame for some of the things that aren't working in this film, I think a lot of it needs to also be aimed at Steve Cloves, but, you know, we'll... we'll maybe... You know, maybe next they week's going to be the they... real test for Cloves, because this is the, the one non Cloves movie, and we'll see if it works better. Maybe they got paid a million per hour that they actually read the book they were adapting. <laughs> maybe that's what it was. There's so many, again, it's in that movie Flame Essay, there is just a compilation of Mike Newell moaning about the length of the book. (laughs) Like, he's just like, it's a big slab of a book, and it's all this stuff. (laughs) Well, on that subject, Chris, director Mike Newell decided against the studio's plan of adapting this longer book into two separate movies. Um, he wanted to. They wanted to do two mo- split it into two movies that were filmed at once, but then separate them and release them a few months apart. Um, he figured he could cut enough of the book's bulky subplots to make a workable movie. Uh, he was wrong, um, but apparently it was uh, Curon um, that apparently convinced him that would be possible. But obviously, Curon had a much smaller book to adapt, so I feel like he, maybe he should have. I not yeah. I think uh, I think they I think he was wrong about what he about whether he achieved it with this film i think this film does show it can be done you just need to be ruthless with the cuts um you know you don't the film works without ludo without spew it could have worked without rita it could have worked without a bunch of other things there is the time in this movie to take a bunch of stuff out and extend a bunch of character stuff and plot logic stuff to make it work and also i think it would have set a slightly dangerous precedent like would we have wanted a series i mean i suppose yes but it would have felt very bloated to have a series which had uh, one, two, and then five times that had twelve movies in, <laughs> because basically, you know, you'd have to do that for every book beyond it. So, and also, it's a story. It's a story about four things essentially: the three tasks and the Yule Ball. I'm not really sure where it, where you cut that in half. So, I think I think it's the right decision not to make it two movies. Um, but just the wrong decision to make the edits they made in this movie. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. What is roughly the halfway point of the actual movie? Well, let's see. Um, the Yule Ball. Okay. It's just yeah. not very... It, although it's quite a good character end. Um, or maybe you... Well, I'll tell you what you do, maybe. You, you have... You... You basically... Maybe you do it where... You build up and up, although it's not a big action sequence. I was wondering whether you do it at the point where Harry literally is about to go underwater with no idea of how to handle the task, but that's not ending on an action beat then. No. Ending and then also your, your, your next movie has to open with an action beat as a result. I tell you what you do. Maybe you do, maybe you do a lot of the ask, you shift it around so that asking everyone out to the Yule Ball and the comedy of the Yule Ball is done before the first task, or even 
you could have the Yule Ball itself done before the first task, uh, and then you end on the first task, maybe. Which would make a lot more sense, because this is another thing this movie bumps into, and I, and I cannot remember if this is a problem in the book. But So he's he's famous, he's rich, he's a successful athlete within the school, and a reasonably functional student. The, the the joke is, you know, oh, you won't have any trouble finding someone to go out with Harry. But then he does. Quite a lot of trouble, actually. And what's weird about that is, in the immediate aftermath of the dragon, they do multiple shots of girls being like, hi, Harry. And then they introduce the concept of the Yule Ball, and suddenly him and Ron walking around trying to talk to girls, they're all giving them disgusted looks and turning their backs on them. And it's literally within two scenes of each other, and I don't understand. So you're right, that would actually probably solve that problem too, because they want the moment after the task where Harry's suddenly an attractive prospect, but if you move the Yule Ball to before the first task, then actually that makes way more sense. Yeah, because then it's just they're doing all the pot of stink stuff, and then it's Harry, but Harry trying to find a date when he's actually hated. I suppose you don't get the Harry Ron comedy if you're doing the double act of them, and they're still technically fighting at this point. Maybe. Oh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, but the um, so there probably are issues with it, but I think I think the logical place to end a, a movie one would be at the end of the first task. Um, but the uh, in answer to your question, there is a sequence in the book where. Uh, a bunch of people are asking him out and do ask him out, but they're, they're, they're not Cho, basically. Cho right, is, Cho is really yes, the... There's one the, where it's like a, like a third... Is. It's like a second or third year Ravenclaw girl asks him out and he's and he doesn't even think about it. He just says no before he has a chance to actually consider it. And she sort yeah. of walks off looking... I remember this. Yes, you're right. Very yeah, the, the, it's basically the problem is... The problem is he can't get Cho alone to ask her and basically he doesn't want to go with anyone else other than Cho. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That works. Okay. Cool. So, um, in the recent Return to Hogwarts special, the cast members discussed uh, the, being quite a different vibe on set when working with Mike Newell. Um, Daniel Radcliffe considered Newell to be the perfect director for this film because he was excited, loud, and passionate. Now, I think excited and loud does describe this movie. Um, personally, uh, oh, sorry, his personality. Sorry. Uh, was those things, and he points out that that energy matched the action-packed nature of this particular film slash book. Bonnie Wright described Newell as a firecracker of energy um, and as having an endearing, childlike quality to him. Rupert Grint mentioned Newell's love of humour and his attempt to bring comedy into each new scene. Now, with that in mind, Chris, um, I would like to tell you about fighting one of the Weasley twins and cracking a rib. Um, right. So, so the, the, as it was originally written, the trivia, uh, it's written, director Mike Newell staged a brawl with one of the Weasley twins, both to demonstrate what he wanted in the scene when they were going to fight each other, but also to intentionally undermine his own authority figure status because all the cast were calling him Sir. The fight right. ended with him uh, fracturing a rib. Now, uh, I don't have the actor's full name, uh, but because there's two, the twins that play the Weasleys, James and Oliver, uh, James says that Newell specifically was encouraging him and Oliver to be really and genuinely annoyed at each other and basically fight for real. He, uh, Newell said, these two were sort of uh, prissing about at it, and I said, no, come on, boys, really, it's a fight. Um, so his scene, uh, his attempt to make the scene more genuine quickly turned dangerous when Newell challenged James to a fight himself. Uh, of course, uh, this is Newell's quote again now. Uh, well, of course, I was a tubby 60-year-old gent at that stage. I really shouldn't have done it. I remember gripping him around the waist and trying to fling him around and so forth, but cracked a couple of ribs and was therefore in absolute agony from that point on. But of course, the wonderful thing was I had made a complete twit- tit of myself, and I think everybody felt much better after that. So uh, he he solved his problem of people respecting him too much um, <laughs> by doing that. That's Madness. absolute insanity. That is absolute <laughs> insanity. I, I, hey guys, everyone's calling me sir and stuff. Just to be clear, I'm I'm not sir. I'm just I'm just Mike. You want to talk to me about anything, anytime? 
approach me honestly guys look i'm a i'm a, i'm an idiot like here's a story of me being an idiot <laughs> cool okay sweet like why the fuck did he need to break a rib getting into a fight with one of the cast that isn't that's is madness <laughs> so good <laughs> what <Jesus. laughs> Good. Um, I kind of both love and hate this guy. <laughs> like, I'm very torn because I think he's an absolute lunatic. And I'm kind of intrigued. I'm like, I'm like fascinated by him. Like, what a strange character this man is, and what a weird movie he made. Yeah. Uh, uh, did you know that, Chris? That during the filming of the Harry Potter movies, Daniel Radcliffe went through 160 pairs of glasses. Did you know that? <laughs> I did. I did know that. Thanks for letting me. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> Um, back to the actual trivia. Um, Henry, Henry Cavill apparently was one of the people who auditioned for Cedric Diggory. I would have liked that. I think he would have been a good Cedric Diggory. I, I enjoy what we got, yes. but it's a small role. It doesn't really matter. I, I, I don't, you know, flip a coin, give it to either of the two. I wouldn't mind it. I think they're both, you know, could have done it. Yeah. Uh, yeah Katie absolutely. Lung, who plays Cho and does a really good job, in my opinion, um, wasn't initially planning on auditioning. She was actually on her way to go do some shopping, and her dad told her that the the audition was basically on the way. So she popped in and did the audition before f- carrying on with her day of shopping. And um, I think it's, it's, I read somewhere that like 3,000 girls auditioned for Cho and then she got it. Uh, fair so. play. I mean, you might as well, you know. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know what? I think she's genuinely very good in the role, but, you know. Um, yeah, I think she's brilliant. Yeah. It's a very, it's, it's hard to do nuance. And that, her being torn because she genuinely does quite like Harry, but also like Cedric in that scene where he asks her out is very good. Like there's a, there's there's a fair amount of nuance in her performance there, which is yeah. Effective. That's that's like the only. I mean, look, Cho in this book doesn't have a lot like to do. You know, she is there. The, the whole point is that Harry doesn't really know her, but he fancies her, so she doesn't get a lot to do. But my one of my favorite parts of her in the in this book is that when she says to Harry, oh, I, I can't, I've already suggested someone else, Harry gets the impression she really sincerely means that. Now, you can write that on the page, but to have an actor or actress take something as vague as that, oh, the other character really believed them and go, okay, I need to inject this with like a certain amount of sincerity successfully... It's a big job. <laughs> that's that's yeah, a hard yeah, thing to sure. do, and she, I, she nails it. She really does. Everything from yeah. her expression and her movements to the to the to the, the the way she slows down to say it. Like I don't know. It's it's very well done. It's very subtle. Mm. Good work. Thumbs up. Um, apparently, an actress called Carol Boquette, Boquette was a director Mike Newell's first choice for Madame Maxine. She couldn't do it though because she had a contract with Studio Canal at the time, um, and they refused to give her permission to negotiate for the role. Um, other people considered for the role, uh, Audrey Tato, I'm not pronouncing that right, the lady that played Amelie, um, Kate Winslet, uh, Catherine Denevu, and uh, Emmanuel Siegler? Siegner. Um, so two names immediately jump out. Obviously, Audrey Tato would have been very interesting for, uh, to, for, for that. And Kate Winslet for Madame Maxine, very strange, but I'm kind of intrigued by that. Yeah, but I kind of love these movies for like like Harry Potter was such a huge thing that you had just global superstars doing the smallest of parts and like you know Kate Winslet as the, as the headmistress sounds nuts until you remember that John Hurt is Mister Ollivander in these movies like and right. when they made Philosopher's Stone like the 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 seventh book hadn't been released it wasn't clear he'd have more to do at a later point it was literally they turned around to john hurt and said do you want to be the shopkeeper like john hurt went yeah no yeah, yeah. Right. The, the, <laughs> his his set made it into more movies than he did yeah yeah exactly <laughs> so as as nuts as the idea of kate wizard because you've got to remember also like we're talking what 2005 aren't we talking peak david tennant as well no and he's got I, we, a fairly sorry, bit we, we, part can we not no i i looked into this i had that exact thought he wasn't playing the doctor yet he had okay he, cool. he had he had said new teeth that's weird is all we'd had as him as the doctor we'd seen the end of chris Reckleston's run he had not yet officially had an episode of doctor who out they hadn't even aired the right. children need special yet so 
People nah, were very familiar with him because it had been in the press that he was taking over Doctor Who, but he had not yet done Doctor Who. It was Christmas that year where he blew up. So, because I, I had the same thought, I'm double checked. Um, he wasn't David Tennant yet. Um, so, yeah, but still, uh, it's still an incredible yeah, thing to give such a role to. But yeah, um, yeah, and and well, yeah, and Kate, but he's not. You know, it's not on the level of Kate Winslet or John Hurt getting that, getting those small parts. But yeah, so as nuts as that sounds, yeah, it, it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> Um, but yeah, let's have a let's have a gander. I've got some other stuff here. I think. Oh yeah, Rosamund Pike. Rosamund Pike was it the first choice to play Rita Skeeter? She declined because she believed it was only a small role um, and would require her to return for the fifth movie as well because the character returned in the fifth book. She later regretted not accepting the part because she actually would have very much enjoyed to work with Mike Newell again. She'd worked with him before. I don't know on what, but on something. Um, that would have been another. Should have good been one. good. The- the actress playing Rita Skeeter is very good. We didn't name her earlier, um, but the and I don't know if I've got her name to hand. I'll look it up. Uh, but she's she's very good, and Rosemunda Punk Pike I think would have been very good as well. Yeah, uh, I, just, I like I just, her a lot. An underused as a character though. I just well, this is really she doesn't get to do anything in this, and that's a real shame. Um, no, but you 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 know that if she was given more to do, she'd have done it well. Like what she yes. does with what she had is very good. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking her up right now myself, I and I can't quite find her name. Me. No, neither could I on the bio. Rita. Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, Miranda Richardson. Oh, of course. Yeah, like Blackadder and a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Game of Thrones, <laughs> I think she was in, wasn't she? Is Miranda Richardson in Game of Thrones? Who did she play in Game of Thrones? I think she was in Game of Thrones. I can't. I don't no, know I don't the name she, of the character. According to her IMDb, she wasn't. But she was in Good Omens. She was Madame Tracy. Of course she was Madame Tracy. Yes, very good. She's excellent. Yeah, she's a good actress. Uh, yeah, no, she would. I'm sure she would have done a good job. Absolutely certain. Uh, if they'd have had more for her character to do. Um, I didn't spot her. I need to look this up. But uh, obviously we talked about this in a previous one. Because we were going through the list of the different actresses that ended up playing Pansy Parkinson. But apparently this is the movie that Charlotte uh, Ritchie is, is briefly in. Um... As Pansy Parkinson, I didn't catch her, but I'm sure she's there. Cool. Oh, I thought I saw her in Prisoner of Azkaban, but I might be wrong. Okay, I, re- I realised afterwards we forgot to mention it, but I thought uh, oh, yeah, I could maybe. be... Um, well, I, did, I didn't like see I, it, so sounds it like I'm wrong. She's in one of them, I don't know. How, maybe it wasn't this one. Um, the underwater scenes were shot in a huge purpose-built tank with a blue screen background. Safety divers would swim in between takes with scuba regulators to allow the actors and actresses to breathe without having to resurface. Daniel Radcliffe alone logged 41 hours and 38 minutes underwater during the course of filming. At one point during training, he inadvertently signaled that he was drowning and sent the entire crew into a massive panic and they got him back to the surface so they must have prearranged some sort of hand motion or something with him to for when he was in trouble he must have accidentally done that hand signal or bit, something he did was interpreted as that and they rescued him when he didn't need rescuing that's quite funny um let's see i've uh just to chip in uh it was this film apparently she was in the scene uh, where the defence against the dark arts class was taking place about the unforgivable curses. So it was this film she was in. Uh, and also, a little bonus trivia for you, uh, Dan. Uh, Miranda Richardson was due to be in Blood Moon, the cancelled Game of Thrones spin-off project. Oh. So, there you go. Not, there, not, not, I wasn't right, but there was a logic. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, she's good. I mean, I, 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 oh yeah, I've just found a shot. That's Charlotte Ritchie. Holy shit, she's just a child. That's yeah. weird to look at. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's bizarre, isn't it? Huh. Well, there you go. Yeah, carry on, carry on, Triven. Yeah, carry on, Triven, indeed. Um, let's see. Um, so the kids only had around three weeks of practicing for the Yule Ball Waltz. Uh, Radcliffe, however, who appears in almost every scene in the entire movie. Uh, had less time than the rest of them um, because he uh, was required for filming. So he only actually had four days to prepare. In several interviews, um, he has given this as a reason why his dancing is mainly shown from the waist up to avoid showing his fumbling feet. But fortunately, this obviously isn't a huge issue because the point is that Harry isn't very good at dancing anyway. <laughs> so there you go. Um, yeah, I, I, th- I thought actually all the Yule Ball stuff was some of Radcliffe's best acting in the in the films. Like mm-hmm. his face when Hermione sends him upstairs and actually the walking in where Hermione's doing that sort of nervous confidence, everyone else is doing a version of confidence and then it cuts to Radcliffe or pans to Radcliffe and he just looks like 
terrified but not wanting <laughs> yeah. to show how terrified. <laughs> Fucking badger um, I thought it was some... Yeah, it was some proper... Yeah, I think Radcliffe was... You know, we, we cancelled it as a question because from this point on, Radcliffe is just good. But he was particularly good at, at that. I yeah, I, I, yeah. Oh, we haven't talked about this actually, but I'm sorry. The hairstyles are all awful in this movie. I don't know what happened. Someone just went. You know what? It's 2005. Boys have all these giant haircuts. We'll just do that. It dates the movie weirdly, and I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, because it. Because let me see if my. Because if this is correct, it's going to be like that. Is crazy. Oh no, it was a few years. It felt like, do you remember that period in music where everyone had that hairstyle? Basically, mm-hmm. Humbug came out for Arctic Monkeys and they had that hairstyle and then Kasabian released their third album and they all had long hair. Yeah. It just felt like that, although this movie's much earlier than that. So, hey, maybe it led the way. But yeah, that was weird. Yeah, very 2005 haircuts. I just It's the only movie where the haircuts feel of the time the movie was made. I guess towards the end a little bit when Harry gets the shorter on the sides haircut you could say that was style of the time as well but I think that is a more timeless look like that look someone would have that haircut now and they wouldn't stand out in a, for a million you know in a, in a million ways but all the boys haircuts mm. from this movie where they're all insanely long and large is weird yeah it's weird don't know why mm. but uh, you know who am I to talk about fashion I've seen me I own mirrors well yeah um <laughs> Fair. With that in mind, uh, in this movie, uh, the audience is given the impression that the Bobatons are all girls and the Durmstrang are all boys. There's only boys depicted as Bobatons and girls depicted as thingy. In the book, it's uh, they're both mixed. Um, and in fact, the two boys that come over and take the Patil twins away from Ron and Harry are actually Bobaton boys. So, mm. yeah, there you go. There you go. Um, so, costume designer. Um, let me get the name right. Uh, Jenny Tomain. Um, Tomain? I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Considered Hermione's dress for the Yule Ball as the most important um, outfit for the cost- uh, for the movie, considering it was sort of a Cinderella moment. Um, the design of the dress was changed several times before the designers were finally satisfied with the results. Emma Watson was careful not to wear it more than necessary because she was afraid she would wreck it. Fear that turned out was not completely unfounded, in the in her very first take of Hermione coming down the stairs in her quote unquote Cinderella moment, apparently Watson tripped and fell down the stairs. Oh wow! I hope. Well, obviously she was okay. Like, yes. but, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, a bit embarrassing and awkward and very Hermione. <laughs> Um, I do love that she immediately tripped in the costume because uh, knowing yeah, that she's fine, very, obviously, very. I would not feel the same way if the story hadn't she broke her arm or anything like that. But knowing that she must have been perfectly fine because they then went and shot it with her not falling down the stairs, um, it does make me chuckle. Um, anyway, early drafts did include um, Percy appearing in a more frequent sort of supporting role, um, but he was written out in the final draft of the script. Um, In the interview, the actor that plays Percy, Chris Rankin, revealed that his contract for the franchise for the first few movies was kind of weird. It said he would appear in four of the first five. So because he appeared in the first three, he either could be in this one or Order of the Phoenix, but not both without an extension. Hmm. Is he in Order? He's not in Order of the Phoenix, is he? Yeah, so given the fact that Percy appears much more in the story for Order of the Phoenix... Um, mm. he he opted out of Does this he? one basically to do that one What's because that's where his character's uh, arc really kicks oh, off. That's full... yeah, yeah, it's that... where they have the falling out. Yeah, yeah. I suppose it's just because in my head, like he he's he replaces Barty Crouch at the ball. He's in he's in the World Cup. He's prominent in that. In my head, there's more for him to. He's maybe got a bigger, more of an arc in order, but it, you know, there's more for him to do. And certainly, right. yeah, in this one story, but uh, okay, cool, that makes sense. Yeah, there's a part of me that just thinks negotiate with the actor to bring him in for all of them, but whatever. Yeah, completely. Because part of me, go, if he if he does if he is in the next film and quite prominent, I know, I'm pretty sure he's not in those scenes at the end of the seventh book. So if if they begin that arc and never pay it off, that's gonna be upsetting. So. 
Yeah, it's weird. I, I, we'll have we to see how that see. plays out. I will keep an eye on that one. But uh, yeah, come back next week for Percy Watch, and we'll let you know. But I, I, I do partly agree with you, but also I'm kind of like relieved because like this movie is already, as we've just established, a bit overstuffed in terms of things it tries to cram in that it doesn't have time to properly explore. And to bring Percy in through that role where he replaces Crouch, then you've got to kind of have the whole thing where oh yeah Crouch yeah is oh, sick and not get, showing up, and like, it starts to spin into a madness. So another bit of yeah, luck get, saving this movie from being a complete shit show where an actor couldn't do the role because <laughs> that's what happened with yeah the completely too. get getting getting rid of him is the right move for the for the movies it just if the if the logic is well he needs to be in the next film i'm like the only way he can be in the next film is either in the background of criminal place or they start an arc they don't finish so uh, we shall let yeah like you say percy watch we'll see what that's about mm-hmm um, while filming his scenes with Professor Dumbledore, Michael Gambon wore street clothes under his flimsy costume and also kept cigarettes tucked in his socks. Um, I can't decide if he's an absolute chad or an absolute twat. Because <laughs> he's just like, I don't give a shit about your stupid, dumb books. I'll do whatever I want. <laughs> And that makes me angry. But also, I just love the idea that he had fucking... The whole time we're watching Dumbledore in these movies, he's got cigarettes tucked in his socks. Yeah, but like, you know, if there's, I mean, if ever a character has needed a cigarette, it's Dumbledore in this movie, isn't it? So, because yeah, chill the fuck out, mate. <laughs> um, apparently, during the underwater filming, Daniel Radcliffe posed with several of the cast and crew under the water to send out, uh, oh, no, not, not to send out, but to get a photo that he then actually used as a Christmas card photo where he uh, photoshopped Rudolph noses and antlers onto all the people while they're underwater. It's kind of fun. Um, let's see. Uh, in the book, Voldemort is described as having red eyes with slits for pupils. The filmmakers ultimately decided not to give Voldemort the red eyes because they felt that one wouldn't be able to read the emotion in the eyes if they were modified and therefore the character wouldn't be scary enough. Uh, yeah, so apparently if you look carefully and you go through it frame by frame apparently there's a moment his eyes turn to slits before they become his gen- real eyes in the transition when he's being you know they're very briefly slit pupils instead of the normal human pupils so yeah fun i guess um final harry potter movie to feature scenes filmed at the university of oxford oxford inspired much of the architecture from hogwarts including the great hall but was not used again following this film yeah there you go Icelandic moviegoers, particularly the younger crowd, would crack up very unexpectedly in theatres when Rita Skeeter introduced herself because apparently the audiences weren't quite expecting that pronunciation of her last name because Skeeter sounds very close to an Icelandic verb, skita, which uh, is sort of a crude word for going for a shit. Well, or having okay. a shit or being a shit. You had a, you had a skita just before this podcast, didn't you, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What what of it? <laughs> Look, mate. No, if, I, if, I'm gonna, if we're going to record for two and a half to three hours, I need to go to the toilet before we start. It's just logical. Mm. Fair so enough. Yeah, did a bit of a skeeter myself. Um, very strange and funny, and a bit sort of reminiscent of the whole um, Bender thing in the UK, where obviously the Avatar mm. TV show and movies use the word Bender in a way that has a connotation in the UK, which caused people to raise eyebrows and chuckle. Um, mm. In, in the you know in the UK when that when those things came out over here, uh, the only Harry Potter movie in the whole franchise to not include and feature Dame Julie Walters, uh, and worse for it. Yes, I would agree with that. Always give me a bit of uh, Molly Weasley. Yeah, Cram- especially Crammer in when summer. like yeah, well, just just have a go go along. <laughs> like fuck it, like yeah, you've got you've got re- really you've got rid of Ludo. Just yeah. have her there. <laughs> Yeah, why can't she go to the Quidditch World Cup? What's... Yeah. yeah. That would actually be better than what they do in the book. Yeah, agreed. Um... And because if memory serves, the Dursley actors got a bit shitty, didn't they? That they weren't going to be in this film. So, yeah, you've already got... You've already upset them. Well, like, this is the thing. Why Julie Walters as well? Well, this is literally the next piece of trivia. So, the f- this is the first Harry Potter movie to not show the Dursleys. They were featured in the book. This is, for those who don't remember, in the book, the Weasley shop to take Harry to Quidditch, and it all goes a bit wrong, having wizards in the Dursleys' house. Um, but this was omitted because the actors and actresses portraying the Dursleys all demanded more money. And as a result, they were just mm. cut. 
Well, I think cutting them in general is the right thing anyway for the movie. But but, um, but it doesn't seem yeah, like that crazy. was the thinking. So it's like a it's an that's accident nuts, that you got man. it right. Fucking hell, what? So we were going to have the whole tongue extending... Because you've got time for it in the book. It's a very good scene. But Dudley's tongue, like, expands and explodes when the Weasleys pick him up and stuff. We're going to do that in this movie? We don't need that. Also, just to loop back to... Sorry, to sorry. what were you going to say then? No, no, I was agreeing with you. I was just agreeing with you. Just to loop back to the uh, Molly Weasley thing, you know what makes that even weirder? As well as the fact that you could have put her in the Quidditch World Cup... Arthur's in the final task. Arthur's like with holding um, dig- Diggory back and stuff. So Arthur's watching the final task. Even just having Julia Walters next to him or doing some of that. like Because that character would absolutely be there. Even in the world of these movies, Molly would be watching the third task. It just smacks of, yeah, but that way we've got to pay the actress, haven't we? 100%. Is, I was just about to say that. It's 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 we don't have anything that to do, to do with her that's going to be major story wise, so we just won't bother p- paying out. That's a shame. That's a massive shame. Yeah, I think so too. I agree. Um mm. originally the filmmakers were going to include the sphinx that Harry encounters in the maze and they were even looking at Grace Jones to voice the sphinx. Uh for those who don't remember, the sphinx gives Harry a riddle. He can either back away not answer the riddle and find a way round, um, or he can try and answer the riddle and risk uh, injury or death, even if it goes if he gets it wrong, or the sphinx steps aside and lets him through if he gets it right. Um, it's a fun part of the book. It also makes the maze feel more like an actual challenge than just get to the center of it. There's also like all sorts of monsters running around it that Hagrid's provided, and yeah, tons of stuff. Um, none of that's in the movie I don't know why they cut the Sphinx I think it works the movie worse uh, but they did so there you go mm-hmm. uh, Brandon Gleeson apparently wore a wig while portraying Mad Eye Moody um, the wig was designed to conceal all the electronics that make the eye work makes so sense yeah. wigs exist uh, wigs exist um, so we've already kind of covered a bit of this um one second. My computer's decided to throw a small tantrum. One sec. Oh, dear. <laughs> Awkward timing. Technical difficulties. Technical Do you want me to do one? Do you want me to fill the time doing one that is probably on your list, but that I could just say because I'm aware of it? Go for it. Um, so while Dan's fixing his computer, uh, the Deathly Hallow symbol makes an appearance in the film uh, just after the pensive scene. Uh, there has been big debate, um, but a lot of people, the, the the overall conclusion seems to be that it is potentially just a coincidence because the seventh book wasn't out, wasn't like was years away from being out when the film was made. So unless Rowling said something very specific about a piece of set. Um, the theory is that it's um, just coincidence, but it's basically once Dumbledore walks over to his uh, kind of cupboards and stuff, it's seen in, in a combination of things on the in the cupboard uh, form the hallow symbol at about one hour, 47 minutes. So I assume that's yes. on your list, but I, I well, happen to know it. So while your computer... It, got it, 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 it was, and then it wasn't, and then it was, because it was on IMDb, someone's like, if you watch the scene at you know, one hour and whatever minutes... Uh, you'll find something of interest in Dumbledore's cabinet. Mm? Mm? And I was like, fuck you, writer of this trivia. Um, you've not told me what it is, which is a dick move, and I refuse to check. <laughs> but then curiosity got the better of me, <laughs> and I did add it. And then I went back to being mad at the guy and deleted it. <laughs> <laughs> so it was not in my trivia, but um, thank you for including it, because you wrote it. Right, so. A, a tidbit to chuck in while your laptop's charging. No, it's we're back. I'm back. I'm, I'm back up now. But um, if you are, if you want to add something, you're welcome to. No, that is what I added. The the definitely hello symbol thing. Is, oh, I think is you, what for I a second, I thought you said you had another bit to add in case my laptop was still coming back up. Okay. No, no I was saying I was saying in a in a world where you yes. know might as well fill the time yes. with a bit of triv. Yeah. Agreed. Very good. Okay, so we already talked about the rock band at the Yule Ball being comprised of uh, members of Pulp and Radiohead, but a funny little bit that came up. In the book, the group is called the Weird Sisters, W-E-I-R-D. 
um, after the witches from William Shakespeare's Macbeth. But uh, reportedly, the band were going to be renamed Weird, spelt W-Y-R-D for the movie. That's what was written in the script. Um, before the movie was released, that was sort of confirmed. Um, but then suddenly, Warner Brothers removed all reference to the names of the, the name of the band um, from the website. And then when it was released, they took it from the DVD. They even changed in Flitwick's introduction to the, this band needs no introduction. <laughs> so he didn't say the name. Because an actual band from Canada called the Weird Sisters, W-I-R-D, were trying to sue Warner Brothers. <laughs> Um, so Warner Brothers just removed every Jesus. reference to it as a real fuck you, and then they had no case, and the court was the court. The, the, so they had no case, so it was dismissed in court. Um, what are you? So, what are yeah. you hoping to achieve? And I don't money. I'm not, I don't. Yeah. I mean money. I'm, I'm not on. I'm not getting at the people because chances are it's someone going. Yeah, we got. We can put together a case and you can get some money here. Like I'm not saying it's necessarily them, but I just. Yeah, I just go back to what are you, what are people hoping to achieve in circumstances like that? Because it's obvious yeah. what the answer is going to be. It's like, well, all right, we'll cut it. There you go, done. Yeah, yeah, doesn't affect the movie in any way. Knowing what the band are called. No. Um, so the character Nigel appears in this movie briefly. Is a, a completely in, in, invented character. Um, he's a small child that shows up and gives Ron a parcel, and they're like, "Hi, Nigel," and then he leaves, and it's all really weird and awkward. Um, it's it's... Oh. Go on. That well, that scene really wound me up because so movie the movie logic here is that Ron has fallen out with Harry because he's jealous. He thinks he's doing it for show and didn't let him in on the secret. That and then the very next scene after they make up, Ron's just exploiting that because the kid wants Harry's autograph. Like, the inconsistency of what that does for the character of Ron and the justification of the argument yeah. was mind-boggling to me. I, sh- I should have made a note about that. Because when that scene happened, I was like, oh, fuck, we, what? Like, given what we've just gone through with these two characters, that's madness. Yeah. Sorry, I just didn't on. like it because I thought the whole scene was awkward and weird. It's so weird watching them close together, isn't it? Like, the total shifts, because speaking of characters, obviously that random Gryffindor student that's just sleeping in a separate dormitory, apparently, is just gone from this film. <laughs> like, we're just, like, he's just disappeared. And, like, if you watch them close together, it's like, where's that kid? Why is he not watching the Triwizard Tournament? Like, I feel bad for that actor. He's like, we're putting you in Harry Potter yeah. for a movie. Yeah, but Bye. not only that, like, we're we're putting you in Harry Potter. Oh, oh, okay, cool. Am I gonna be like one of the one of the guys in the background, like Dean Thomas, and just I'm just gonna chill? No, 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 no. You've got you've got lines. I've got lines. Oh, sweet. Like, am I like, oh, hi, Harry? Or no, no, no. You've got actual lines relevant to the plot that make a difference. Oh, awesome, sweet. Am I coming back? No, no, you're not coming back. No, no, sorry. Although I think that, I think that, I think the actor does return for the Order of the Phoenix. I think they're in Dumbledore's army. I think I read when I was um, working out who they were in whether it was meant to be a character we knew or all that stuff. That's hilarious. We'll double check. So the character's name is Bem and (laughs) the character... Is fifth year in his fifth year, Ben became a member of Dumbledore's army. Yeah, so he's in like some of the group shots of uh, for Dumbledore, the Dumbledore's army scenes in the next Brilliant. film. Well, there you go. Uh, so yeah, so um, apparently it seems likely that uh, the, the, this character that was introduced, Nigel, was some sort of substitute oh, sorry, for Colin yeah. Creevy, um, which is weird for a couple of reasons. First of all, okay, maybe they couldn't get the actor back that played Colin Creevy, so they've done a swap, swap out, right? Maybe they wrote the script and included Colin, but then couldn't get the actor, so they made this character up, Nigel. But um, the fifth book is where they introduce Colin Creevy, Creevy's brother, Dennis. Mm. So couldn't it have, instead of him saying Nigel, couldn't he have just said Dennis? He wouldn't have needed to explain anything. That just would have been a little Easter egg for anyone who's familiar with the book. They'd have gone, oh, it's Colin yeah. Creevy's little brother. Cool. Yeah, completely. That's one of those little Easter eggs that would have been like, fine. It's like, you've, you've mentioned the thing in your other, other your, your, your scene that's doing other stuff. So it's a little hint that that character exists for people interested. But if, it, if not, 
the, the scene plays out exactly the same as it does in the final product. Just change the name Nigel to the name Dennis. That's all you need to do. Weird. Anywho, this is a good one. During the filming of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix... Wait, that's not this movie. Why is that in this movie's trivia? Oh, I see. Okay. So, during the filming of Order of the Phoenix, Alan Rickman banned Rupert Grid and Matthew Lewis from coming in within five metres of his new BMW because during the making of Gobbler of Fire, they spilled a milkshake all over his car. <laughs> that's my favourite piece of trivia yet. Oh, God, that must have been terrifying for them. <laughs> Oh, so there no. you go. Now I tried to find out because uh, it's sad news for everyone: cars don't exist. There is not a single car in this movie. The movie doesn't even have a listing in uh, the Internet Movie Car Database. There oh, is not man. a single car that appears in this movie. I cannot do cars exist. Have you thinking, okay, Dan? What have you replaced it with? Horses exist. Cats exist. Nothing. I got nothing. So the closest I could get to was I tried to Google what what kind of BMW Alan Rickman drove that got milkshakes spilled on it. Could not find that information either. Wow. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then, we, then there's no noises, unfortunately. No. There's not even a lot of like. I feel like I'm cancelling Christmas there? right now, but I genuinely can't that do cars does, exist. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's right. There's not. There's not a car in the movie. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, but sometimes when we do a movie like that, uh, uh, you know, where there's no physical cars appear in it for whatever reason, like Lord of the Rings, I find a substitute. You know, I did horses exist. Yeah, but, you know, there's not. Well, yeah, there's not. There's no. There's no new horses in this, is there? Um, no. 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 And all I can find is that Alan Rickman banned Rupert Grint and Lewis from being close to his new BMW. I can't find the model. Which is, to be fair though, that, I mean that, um, I'm trying I'm trying to find, while you're doing that, I'm trying to find if there's a reason uh, Hugh Mitchell, who played Colin Creevely, didn't return, but I can't, uh, I can't see anything. Um, the Although there's a theory here that he basically the actor moved, aged quite quickly, but that's pure fan theory stuff. Um, I yeah, I can't think of one, but you know what? The the milkshake trivia makes up for it. That's fine. Yeah, and it is car. It's car adjacent. It's car yeah. adjacent. Oh yeah, completely. Yeah. 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 Uh, very final bit of trivia that I have, Chris. Very final, uh, just because you know, people people like to know this sort of thing. Um, this film was, had a working title of Happy Days to to. to um, uh, you know, to sort of disguise what the production was from various locations yeah, cool. as they were filming and to make sure people didn't show up to do the set. And uh, they also actually shipped the movie to cinemas under the Happy Days title um, to ensure pirates, you know, wouldn't steal the reels. So there you go. Mm, nice. That's there you go. That's trivia for this week, Chris. Right. Let's do some ranking. So uh, can I just read this comment? Can I just read this comment on this story? Please do. <laughs> the actor playing Colin Creevely, Hugh Mitchell, was affected by ever by whatever it was on set that caused pretty much all of the Harry Potter child actors to turn into at least fairly good looking, if not better, after after puberty hit. Puberty hit. At least that's how one of my friends describes it. So that means in the years after the second movie, he grew to be tall and attractive, um, looking not the short kid Colin was supposed to be in the books. Since he no longer looked like his characters, the filmmakers decided to remove the role from the movies and replaced him and replaced him with the only with the movie only character Nigel, who was a composite character of ha- of Colin and his younger brother Dennis. So whether that fan is basing that on anything, but that does the popular theory is that Nigel is a composite of the two. Well, there, there you go. go. Well, there you go. Um, rankings. Uh, this is easy for me. So for those who don't remember, we, we've sort of been doing the rankings. So far, the second one was my favourite. Um, Azkaban is my second favourite. And, 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 and up until this one, my least favourite was Philosopher's Stone. Um, but crashing in uh, number four. Now, currently the lowest ranked one is this movie. Uh, this is a this is a bad movie. Uh, so four, one, three, and then two being my favourite um, is my current ranking. Chris, where are you at? I mean, I'm also putting it last. I can't not given yep. like all the all the rage felt after and just ending it going. That film's a bit of a mess. I'll be honest with you, Dan. It almost made me retrospectively put chamber uh, change my order to be your order again because i was just like 
Azkaban has a lot of these sins. How am I forgiving that easier just for just for the beautiful mm. filmmaking? But actually, especially the more we've talked about it, I don't think it has as many of these scenes. So I'm going to I'm going to stick with where mm-hmm. where we're at for that. Uh, but I will say, look, we're not dealing with we're not dealing with Knowles. The acting's better. I can't overly remember Order of the Phoenix, but I know it's popular amongst people. Popular. I don't know why I said it like that. But I'm going into Order of the Phoenix quite excited. And I'm literally going into Order of the Phoenix. I'm watching it in about ten minutes, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're watching it. We're watching it this evening. We're recording tomorrow, so yes, I will also be watching it soon. Um, it'll be the it'll be the least gap, uh, maybe not the least gap, because like I said, I had to watch Goblet a couple of nights ago. But yeah, anyway, um, yes, I I am holding out. I'm. I went into Goblet with a bit of trepid- trepidation. I'm certainly going to be going into Half Blood Prince with trepidation. Um, and I'm probably going to have to play around with the colours on the TV because my memory of that film is it's saturated to fuck. Um, but I <laughs> am going into Order of the Phoenix, potentially for the last time <laughs> of, this, of this series, um, because the ending of Deathly Hallows 2, whilst it's overall a very good film, Jesus, um, we'll talk about it when we get there. But potentially for the last time, I'm going into <laughs> Order of the Phoenix quite excited. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting because I, 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 so I'm putting a lot of stock in this because I've been Mr. Steve Cloves is a big part of why these movies are a mess, um, and he had an easier. It was, it was, it's, it's disguised in the first couple because they're shorter, simpler books, so it didn't expose his inability to make those bold choices we talked about when reviewing this movie to streamline it um, and explore the actual characters and story that you're trying to tell um and, f- and focus it down on those and instead it's just a collection of here's that thing from the book visualized sort of without any of the co- relevant context or character work here's that thing from the book you remember visualized without any of the context or character work um we'll have to see what happens with order because order is the biggest book but it's written by someone different if mm, that's this, what I'm very excited to see. If this writer makes a more coherent movie than Goblet or Half Blood Prince than Cloves did, then that that really solidifies for me that Cloves was the was a lot of the issue and that it could be achieved. And this isn't just an unwinnable task because look, some books are unfilmable. There's a reason Neil Gaiman spent years denying the rights to Sandman to be made into a film. And he said it very clearly many times. I wrote 3,000 pages of a comic book. You cannot condense it to a movie. Mm. He wanted to do it as a TV show. The TV show has been out this last couple of weeks. For uh, for, for those of you listening who don't know, we record these like between five and ten weeks ahead. So if you're wondering why I'm talking about the Sandman as if it's just come out, it just has. Um, He was right. (laughs) He was t- he was correct. So maybe the answer is no writer could have successfully taken the Harry Potter books and made them really great top tier films because they're just too s- separated and almost episodic and bitty storyline wise as the plots develop and shift to see as the as the school year goes on to be converted into one singular focused movie. Maybe that's what we're going to discover here, or maybe the next one's going to be pretty good. And I'm going to spend the last three movies bitching about clothes. So, let's... well, well, you know, Dan. At, at the end of the let's day, see. <laughs> my, at the end of the day, mate, Michael Goldenberg, the writer of this of Order of the Phoenix, also wrote the Green Lantern movie with Ryan Reynolds. You know, oh, fuck. It. So, <laughs> you know. So maybe this won't I, um... prove anything. Maybe it's just the Harry Potter movies got. <laughs> Several shit writers <laughs> to be but fucking. When hell. I say I'm making it clear which Green Lantern movie there, he didn't write it with Ryan Reynolds. It's just that is the movie. His 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 he only has on Wikipedia at least five credits: Bed of Roses, Contact, Peter Pan, the 2003 movie, uh, Harry oh, Potter, and the Phoenix, and oh, Green Lantern. Dear. So that 2003 <laughs> Peter Pan, if it's the one I'm thinking of, was bad, and I'm pretty sure. Contact was okay, but very slow and boring. That was the Jodie Foster well, movie, right? 
by Rob, was... Rob, by Rob, Rob Zemeckis. Yes, yeah, Jodie Foster. Yeah, yeah. So and that's a, that's Pan, like a really interesting idea big... that's like spread out so thin over like a two hour period that it feels really plodding. Oh dear. The Peter Pan is uh, J- Jason Jason Isaacs playing Hook and right. uh, yes. George Darling. Yeah. yeah, that's the one I'm thinking of. That was not a good movie. So, <laughs> wow. <laughs> we should say, I mean, the, look, there's four other names attached to Green Lantern. So, you know, and just his name on Harry Potter. So we shall see. We shall see. Oh, my God. So actually, this might not prove anything. But, well, let's find out. I'm going to literally, I'm probably going to be watching it 10 minutes after this moment. So thanks, everyone, for, um, for because I'm, I'm trying to, s- to salvage some of my evening so I can spend some of it with Nadia. Because the last few weeks have been, hey, Dan, what are you doing today? Oh, some combination of watching Harry Potter, doing the trivia for Harry Potter, thinking about Harry Potter, making notes on Harry Potter, recording a podcast for Harry Potter, or my day job. So, uh <laughs> <laughs> be, be nice to have some of the evening if I can watch the movie sooner. So yeah, thanks everyone for listening. Okay, you can get to the usual I, places. We, we need to we need to talk about it after because we need to see if um, if we're able to work out a date for it yet. But I have not watched much for the next nothing but static. But we'll, we shall deal with that when we come to it. Uh-huh. Anyway, you um, you were gonna sign well, we us can, off. if we have to delay it a couple of days, that's fine. I don't think that's going to be a problem. Uh, but yeah, uh, right, we'll sort out. you can get us in all the usual places. So it's uh, Patreon if you want to support us with money. The real money, hard-earned cash for as little as one dollar a month or more, if you're feeling particularly generous. Um, I wouldn't bother myself, but you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> you can do. Uh, once you're on the Patreon, you get episodes of this uh, rewind reviews and our other podcast, uh, Av- analyzing Avatar, one week early. So if you want to hear us talk about Order of the Phoenix and figure out the mystery of Steve Cloves and uh, this other this Green Lantern dude whose name has already escaped my mind, but I'll, I'll, I'll commit it to memory before next week's podcast. Um, uh, you know, uh, if you want to get to that mystery now, you can go listen to that episode right now by going and giving as little as one dollar a month and then you go to the Patreon, you'll get it and you can listen and you can check and you can find out what the conclusion is. Um, if not, if you'd like to support us in a non-financial way, you can tell a friend, you definitely know someone who likes Harry Potter, nudge them into watching these and maybe they'll go and check out our other Rewind reviews. Um, you can also review us on the various podcast platforms of your preference so itunes spotify whatever you use it'll probably have some sort of review or star or heart system where you can indicate that you enjoy it and then that makes the algorithm algorithm slash you know algorithm tm uh, will then figure out whether to recommend our stuff to other people so that can support us also or if you just think these are okay and you're listening to them out of just not having anything better to do then you don't have to do any of that stuff you can just listen we appreciate you doing that that's fine also you're allowed to be uh, ambivalent to what we do here on Nothing But Static. That's, that's great. We enjoy that. Um, and if you absolutely hate this, I would recommend stopping. Just don't put... If you're not enjoying this, you're frustrated, you don't agree with any of our perspectives, you don't think we're funny, you don't think we're interesting, don't listen, would be my advice. Yeah. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. We cover the whole spectrum there, from people enjoying this enough to give us money to people that hate it. I think we've given you all... Yeah. Um, uh, sufficient and correct homework. <laughs> yeah. Even though most people fall in the no opinion whatsoever category, smack bang in the middle of those two things. Yeah, it's fine. Absolutely fine. Be be ambivalent. I don't mind. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for listening so much. We, we really do appreciate it. Um, you know, we, we really enjoy doing these. They're, 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 you know, I joke about how much of my life gets dedicated to these when we have to do, especially when we're doing a couple close together. But, um, uh, you know, I really have fun dissecting these sorts of movies and I've, I've had a good time particularly doing these Harry Potter ones because I've been itching to talk about these movies for a long time and this has been very cathartic. Uh, and I'm relieved that I've, I seem to have mostly scrubbed myself from the in-the-book stuff from the first episode of this. I feel like we've had to learn how to review these movies uh, over the course of the first yeah, two or I've, three. I, I've, been, uh, I've been way worse than that this week but I think it's because the book's so fresh in my mind whereas I'm not going to... I'm not going to get to the Order of the Phoenix now and then in turn won't get to the Half-Blood Prince before. So I think there'll be even less of that from both of us uh, mm-hmm. next week because I've been a little guilty of that this week. Yeah, I, I, would say, I would say you were actually fairly guilty of that last week too. I mean, we I, I had two doing it mm, really strongly. Yeah, I think the first two I was heavy on that and the second two you were quite heavy on that. So maybe, we'll, maybe we've yeah, both purged it from our system now. <laughs> we've, now we've both been the, uh, you know, push his nose up glasses in the book guy. Um, no, push his nose up glasses? Push his glasses up nose guy. Um, pushing his nose up glasses, that's an interesting visual. 
I can't get that out of my head now. Anyway, <laughs> thanks very much for listening. We do appreciate you. Uh, you can send us feedback if you have any, of course, to Twitter. Uh, send it to Twitter, not to us. Send it. To, we don't. We don't want to read it. <laughs> Just tell Twitter what you think. Um, to <laughs> at at Twitter support, well, uh, they'll they'll get back to you. I'm sure. <laughs> No, I'm at Dan Doolan. He's at C Billingham with two M's. Obviously, you can also leave a longer comment if you want on the YouTube video version of this podcast, which is available at youtube.com slash nothing but static UK. The Patreon, if I haven't already said it, is patreon.com slash nothing but static. And if you want to send us an email, you're welcome to do that too. We don't always get back to them, but we do love receiving them. It's mail at nothing but static co dot UK. So there you go. That's all the stuff. Thanks everyone for listening. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Chris to do a do to do his his his, his traditional uh- ending. I've been Chris Billingham. I've been Dan Doolan. And this review from the Wizarding World has been rewound. Is that your succinct summary of your feelings on the Wizarding World? Type? Yes. You, can I tell you what? I'll give you a little, a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of extra information here, Chris. Um, I was struggling to find artwork that doesn't include the word Wizarding World for these movies. Mm. <laughs> Just making Fair. the little poster book things that I've been making. Um, mm. Half the artwork comes with the Wizarding World logo plastered all over them now because it's come from recent yeah, DVD they, or Blu-ray yeah. releases. Great. Great job on those, though. They look brilliant. Yes, I'm very excited. I'm going to make. I'm going to make some more of them tonight. I've only made two so far, but I've I've got all the assets together now to make the rest. So uh, they look good. I'm pretty yeah. pleased. Yeah, no, yeah, really pleased with them. Anyway, mm. cool. Ca- so yeah, catch you later. I, in summary, I hate the Wizarding World as a f- catchphrase to cover this universe. Yeah. So fuck you, Warner Brothers, and yeah. goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>